lost uh, some 50 odd uh, going for the examination. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, three research centers, one in incubation facility, uh, where, almost, where almost 20 uh, plus startups are being encouraged. Uh, so we are within the span of uh, four years, uh, six years, we have uh, done a great leap in uh, advancing the uh, technology as well as the, the learning in various fields. Now we have seven schools out of which uh, social sciences and humanities is one of the school and then very thriving uh, with e uh, young and then uh, energetic faculty. Uh, we wish that more and more we would like to collaborate with the other institutions in uh, organizing such international conferences. Maybe we would definitely make a, a dent and then uh, try to enhance the knowledge uh, generation and dissemination among the various stakeholders. We would also like to thank um, uh, our speakers over here, uh, Professor Kerry J. Winter from Sunny Buffalo, and then Dr. Ida Nals from NTU. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you will definitely, I hope you'll enlighten many of our young uh, budding researchers. Uh, into this domain and definitely they would do uh, very good work uh, with this i wish all the very best to all the delegates and then participants uh, wishing you a three day uh, of happy learning and then knowledge sharing thank you very much thank you so much sir for your encouraging words and also for encouraging us to carrying on the legacy of vid uh, so it is my privilege now to propose the vote of thanks First of all, we sincerely thank Dr. Jagadish Matitanti, a registrar, sir, for his encouraging and inspirational words. We sincerely thank our associate dean, Dr. Tahya Absal, ma'am, for your constant encouragement and support on such short notice and your meticulous uh, endeavor to make everything perfect. We sincerely thank the plenary speakers uh, from Singapore and US. We also profusely thank the School of Social Sciences and Humanities, which for their warm, constant support to us. We are grateful and thankful to all the participants from various parts of India and around the world to join us in this erudite conference. With this, we come to an end of this inaugural session and we shall go ahead to begin the first plenary session of the day. I thank all the, uh, all the dignitaries here, all the plenary speakers and participants for joining us for this inaugural session. Uh, we look forward to a very constructive day of deliberations and discussions. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Daya, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Edda Nats. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, without much further ado, we shall go ahead and uh, start our first plenary session of the day. Before that, I would request Dr. Shubhra Ghoshal to introduce our esteemed plenary speaker. A warm good morning to all the delegates present here. Uh, the School of Humanities VITAP welcomes you all to this virtual plenary session. It's a great pleasure for me. Mute the others. Ask the CTS to help mute the others in the session. CTS is walking. Yeah. Mute others. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Irda Nals. Dr. Nals is a lecturer at Nanang Technological University, NTU, Singapore. She received a BA in education with specialization in English and literature from NTU and an MA in applied linguistics from the University of Colorado in Colorado, America. She also has a PhD in education and human development from CU. She is passionate about bilingualism and multilingualism and is interested in educational studies, identity and critical theories. She believes in empowering the marginalized communities through education. 
Today also, she has tried to establish a connection between educational reforms and sexual revolution. So her title of today's talk reads, Sexual Revolution, Creating a Space in Classroom, Utilizing Educational Reforms. So now, Dr. Nals, welcome again, and please go ahead with your talk. Over to Dr. Nals. Thank you very much for the warm introduction and welcome. And good morning to everyone present. Um, this is actually the first time I'm doing a conference via Zoom, so I'm going to try to toggle the technology a bit. I'm going to share my screen. So give me a few minutes to do screen sharing. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so this talk is going to be a little bit interactive towards the end. There's going to be a workshop and I hope that everyone can participate in the workshop. So I'll walk you through um, how you can think about the workshop and how you can actually um, apply it to your own classroom practices or in other aspects of your organization. So again, uh, my name is Nals and I go by she, her. My talk is on sexual revolution, creating a safe space in classrooms, utilizing educational reform. So um, I focus a lot on education and educational development in all of my research areas. So this is our agenda for today. I'll be going through key terms and the frameworks that I'm looking at. Uh, do stop me and ask questions if you have concerns about something I'm talking about or if something is not very clear. I will also be looking at the timeline of two different countries, um, Singapore as well as India, because I think there are a lot of learning points in each of our historical development towards sexual revolution that we can learn from. And then after the timeline, we will look at some workshopping and look at how in the future we can better the society that we live in. So I will begin by first offering my positionality and my research areas. So firstly, I begin by offering my identity and my positionality. I am a queer mixed heritage Singaporean female in the field of education. So queer studies is of particular interest to me, especially in studying the operations of heteronormativity for three reasons. The first reason is in me acknowledging my marginalized identities and critical disposition as a female in academia. And not only a female, I'm also a woman of color in post-colonial white supremacist educational system. Um, in that sense, Singapore and India share something similar in our history. We both were colonized and now we're going through the post-colonial era. So a lot of us still have the colonial mindset. So what do I do with that? So I believe that my unique racial and gender positioning gives me the insight into the mechanism of race and patriarchy in education. In fact, black women and women of color in general, as Colin suggests, have unique sensitivity to the operation of race and gender, which often go undetected by mostly men and white men especially. And such, I embrace my racial and gender identity and acknowledge the application that it provides for my work and analysis. Secondly, given that my research look into critical theoretical analysis of how a hegemonic mechanism of race and gender impact education, it behooves me to apply such scholarship to the realm of heteronormative curriculum. Essentially, I apply my scholarship to name the world to change it. That is, I am genuine in my approach, in my approaches to, soci to socially just education and undoing oppressive education. So I must first commit myself to finding ways to name new social ills beyond race and gender. A process that Fryer argues is not possible if not infused with love. Therefore, the application of the scholarship to unveil heteronormative curriculum in Singaporean society is how I enact my love for the queer community and that is itself a commitment to the cause, the cause of liberation, the cause towards freedom, 
the cause towards equality and equity. Finally, regardless of my sexual orientation, which when exposed is often used. Oh, you need a bit, like, Okay. I'm sorry, does someone has a question? Okay. Sorry, Edda, is this okay now? Uh, yeah, I thought someone had a question. Uh, no, sorry for the interruption. There's some technical okay. issues from our end. So sorry. I, okay, I understand because when it comes to IT. Do I continue? Yes, please continue. Yes. All right. So finally, regardless of my sexual orientation, which when exposed is often used in a way to discredit or project bias onto one's analysis, I operate with the presumption that hegemonic heteronormativity operate. That is much like how critical race theory recognizes the endemic nature and prominence of race and white supremacy, the presence of heterosexism, homophobia, and heteronormativity exists as social norms that go unnoticed and uncontested in Singaporean society. Just as scholars of colour and specifically women of colour are presumed incompetent and taken from the title of one of my favourite books by Gabriel Gutierrez, due to white supremacy and patriarchy, I'm aware of such hegemonic mechanism can also be applied to the work of LGBTQ community. As such, I proceed with this in mind, never forgetting both my positionality and my identity when they are situated in a power structure of race, class, gender, and heteronormativity. So later in my workshop, I will also invite you to reflect on your identity and your positionality so that you can better contribute to the community and the organization that you work in. So that being said, this is the gist of what I'll be covering, the flow, which I think earlier um, one of the speakers have already introduced my abstract. So I look at gender roles in society. I question patriarchy as prescribed by social norms. I apply creative framework and the growing scholarship of critical whiteness, which is initially based on the examination of whiteness as a race and culture that produces white privileges onto the idea of gender. And therefore, we will then question our own privileges in society. Some of us enjoy certain privileges. With those privileges that we enjoy, how can we better ourselves in our community? On the other hand, with the lack of privilege that we have not been afforded, how can we made, be made aware of our rights? What can we do to better ourselves and the future of our community? So using educational reform, we begin to create a safe space in our classrooms that are inclusive of all gender. Uh, we build a better and stronger community for an evolved society of today. So we, later we will look at timelines of sexual revolution of our past and our present as we strive to build an inclusive future regardless of gender and orientation. And we will also carry out a workshop activity together where I will invite you to explore your positionalities and roles in society as we reflect on our lived experiences, as what I have shared with you earlier, my lived experiences, um, and then we will leverage on our strength. And together, we will build one another up to overcome our struggles. We will empower the students that come our way as they continue to pass on the baton onto an ongoing journey of sexual revolution. So that is what I hope to achieve with my sharing today. So the two key terms that I will be um, discussing today, uh, which I feel is very important, um, sexual revolution and modern fascism. So what are they? So when we talk about sexual revolution or when I talk about sexual revolution today, I am talking about challenging the traditional codes of behavior related to sexuality and interpersonal relation. So we are looking past the traditional roles that we have played in the past. We are looking past the prescribed behavior, the expected norms of society, and we are challenging that so that we can not only better ourselves, but also the society that we live in and for the future we want to create for the generations to come. 
So that is what I hope to, to look at and to share with you today through sexual revolution and also hopefully for you to go through during the reflective workshop. When we talk about modern fascism, we are looking at something very extreme. We are looking at a society that is very far right, very authoritative, very uh, dictatorship, very oppressive, and which is very guided by military approach where it is a very oppressive society and citizens are not allowed or are highly discouraged to disagree with the environment and as progressive as Singapore is we are in some ways um, quite like that because we are a, a state that is driven by that is governed by military men and um, we, we are not allowed to disagree with the government, especially with recent laws that doesn't allow us to write anything that do not agree with certain policies that is being passed. So how do we get past that? How do we get through that in an education state that I work in? So those are the two key terms that I uh, wish to go through. Any questions so far? All right, then I will go on to the framework that I will be using. Um, so I look at two framework. One is critical whiteness, um, which is the framework that I use for most of my analysis work and most of my research work. And then I look at pedagogy of the oppressed, which sounds very demoralizing, but actually it is a framework that empowers educators, empowers students, empowers people who choose to look at the framework from a different perspective. So first, I will talk about critical whiteness and how it applies in sexual revolution. Because when we look at critical whiteness, we think about race. But as I've shared earlier, we are always looking at our intersectionality. Race never appears on its own. Gender never appears on its own. Neither does orientation. There is always intersectionality of this and therefore that is how critical whiteness come in. So critical whiteness is a theory based on reflection and on empowerment. It is adapted from critical race theory or in short CRT. It positions the responsibility of knowledge or in our research term we know it as entomologists and epistemologists on the majority community through the act of reflection on their own privileges within the society that they live in in order to share power with the marginalized and suppressed community. So in the case of sexual revolution then, we are looking at the majority community and the minority community. What can the majority community do and what can the minority community do to empower themselves while sharing the power with the majority community. So we need to identify who these key players are in the community that we live in. And in sexual revolution, the majority community would be the male because they are always higher on the social hierarchy of power. Um, this is of course shown in terms of income gap in society and just political power that they hold within any given community or society. So therefore, I would say that the majority community or the community with power would be male, even in the educational field that I work in. While the marginalized and suppressed community would be female, such as myself, and especially people who identify as non-conforming sexual identities, such as gender queer. So again, that is myself. So then I would say my intersectionality is way below because I am not only female, I am also gender queer, and in addition to my mixed heritage. So you can also reflect on yourself and where you would position yourself, whether you would have power to share or you would have to acknowledge your own marginalization and then look at what can be done and how you can still give back despite that marginalization that you face. So the next framework that I would like to highlight and share with everyone is called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. 
and how it appears in sexual revolution. So pedagogy of the oppressed is introduced by Fryer, one of my favorite writer, um, in a book in 2012. Um, he highlighted a critical pedagogy similar to what Mammy, Mammy in 1992 wrote, where the oppressed are in a position that gives them power to free the oppressor by first freeing themselves. So that is how I look at myself, despite being in a position where, in a field of education, dominated by male, I am a female. And I am not only a female, I am gender queer. So how do I still empower myself in the field of education? One of the ways I've done it is through sharing of knowledge. Sharing of knowledge with um, a community of practice, like what I'm doing right now, or with my students on a daily basis. So that is empowering because I'm freeing myself and I'm sharing my knowledge with others who may be similar to me or who may be different and offer knowledge that I can learn from. And again, of course, in sexual revolution, the oppressor are the males while the oppressed are the female and non-conforming sexual person. Now, I'm not saying that the male are always oppressing others, but it is just a generic term. Of course, I've come across many, many helpful colleagues and like this talk, uh, males who do want to share their power with females or with the oppressed. And that is what I'm talking about. When you choose to share that on that platform, you are elevating and creating a more equal community, a more equal society. That is us building up to that. Any question at any point? All right. So I would like to share this quote, uh, which is written by Ellen in 2004. So I think one of the uh, earlier speaker talked about how dialogues are important. So Ellen says, through text and dialogue, critical educators need to create an environment of safe dissonance. So I think it is very important for us as educators in a position of power in the classroom to be willing and to be open to engage in dialogues, even if they are very, very difficult conversations, even if they are conversations that we may not agree with. But I think the least we can do is be willing to listen to what the students may have to say, to what others may have to say so that we can share that knowledge and understand a different position from our own. And in response to what Ellen said, so this was my response to Ellen, I believe that a phenomenon safe space in a classroom allows for engaging conversation so that we can create a sexual radical heterosexual identity so that we can have discussion that may not always agree, but we can come to a place of compromise and a better understanding in the society that we live in. So that being said, with all the dry theories that I've shared, is there any question at this point before I go to something that more people can perhaps identify with? All right, then I am going to uh, look, I'm going to share timelines um, I believe that majority of the um, participants here are an expert in this timeline. So I know that India has a very rich history with regards to sexual revolution. And um, one of the earlier speakers actually talked about how uh, prescribed to the traditional roles of gender has been in India. But I was uh, very enlightened when I did my own research. And then I found out how progressive India has always been. So I found out that in ancient India, as early as 500 BCE, um, India has, has led in influencing the Chinese, the Japanese, the Tibetan, the Southeast Asian culture in terms of sexual revolution. India is actually very advanced. But of course, in today's discussion, we don't really hear about that. So I was really very enlightened to hear about this. And then in the 1st and 6th century, there was the introduction of the Kama Sutra. And in fact, I further found out that such art was also common in Hindu temple, which is very beautiful. I myself have not seen such art in, in Hindu temples in, in, in Singapore. But, um, well, 
Then uh, moving on to the more modern times, in 2014, there was the big move of the recognition of third gender in India, which was, I must say, um, gained a lot of popular discussion, especially in Singapore, because we are not as progressive. That's why I say there's so much to learn from one another when we have the sharing platform. So that was great that there was this recognition of third gender in India, um, which I say is, is a great movement. And then in May 2022, the Supreme Court orders that prostitution as a job is afforded the same human rights as any other jobs. So I think this is another very progressive move uh, in India because even in Singapore, even though prostitution is recognized as a job, the difference is that prostitutes need to have license to, to, to be recognized as an occupation. But then that was all to it versus in India where it is more progressive and you are given the same human rights. So I feel that that is a very progressive move in terms of sexual revolution. So I think all along, India has always been very progressive in terms of sexual revolution. It is just something that maybe not shared with the rest of the world because when, when we read about news in India, what I do come across, honestly, is always more of the disparity. So I feel that these are learning points that we can take from, leverage on, and empower ourselves and the community that we live in and learn from one another. So uh, in 2023, which is very recent, which is this year, and it is still, even though there is no recognition to same-sex to same -sex marriage in India as yet, and I like to emphasize on the term as yet, uh, but same-sex couple in India can cohabit, live together, and they are afforded the same rights as heterosexual unmarried couples. Uh, I'm, not, mm, I'm not very confident about this information, so I guess most of you would know more than me, but what I read is that, and I could be, I could be um, inaccurate about this information, that there are many unmarried couples in India, uh, but I guess that put, but based on what I've read then, same-sex couple and unmarried couple, they are given the same rights. So I guess there is more recognition in India than it is in Singapore because when I compare that to Singapore as I'm going to share with you the timeline later we don't have such rights so I feel that in terms of sexual revolution India is definitely much more progressive in moving forward compared to a so-called very progressive state like Singapore as we are recognized but in actuality in terms of our policy we're not quite there yet okay so this is Singapore timeline some of the bigger events that happened in Singapore. So in 1973, we had gender reassignment surgery legalized. So um, even though it is legalized in Singapore since 1973, there hasn't been a lot of local Singaporeans conducting such surgeries because of the rights that is not afforded to them. But Singapore at one point was the center in Southeast Asia for a lot of gender reassignment surgery. Mm, mostly involving foreigners who come to Singapore to do the surgeries, not so much of the local Singaporeans. And in the 1990s, there were a lot of anti-gay movements where there was very organized and structured way of uh, police officers dressing up in plain clothes where they suspect there were a lot of gay movement and putting this man behind bars because being gay in Singapore then was considered illegal and therefore there were a lot of these movements and men were being persecuted for being gay. Uh, we also have raids in lesbian places where they will search you and they will actually do body search on you. So they make it very difficult when your identity is non-conforming. In 2009, Singapore started our very first Pink Dot. So Pink Dot is a movement that um, empowers gender non-conforming, gender queer communities in Singapore. Pink Dot is quite a, a big movement. Back then in two, two, 2009, we were the first country to start it and it has spread to other countries. Now even countries like uh, the US, um, have started their own Pink Dot movement and I was and I'm very proud to say that I've attended the one in US. It was really beautiful. Small, 
uh, but really beautiful. And Pink Dot message has spread to everywhere around the world. I guess that was something good we did in Singapore then in terms of sexual revolution. That was a very big move. But then subsequently, they have made changes to the policy to Pink Dot to not allow foreigners to enter and attend the event. So that was making one step forward, two step back, which also means that companies that are non-local are not allowed to, to donate or to help in the event as well. Then in 2014, we made a big uh, move. We had T Project. T Project is a non-profit uh, charitable organization. It was set up to help people who has gone through gender reassignment or who wants to go through gender reassignment to acclimate and get help. So it is a shelter, it also does fundraising and it helps a non-conforming genderqueer community in Singapore. Then finally, just last year in 2022, we repealed 377A, which means that finally, uh, after so many years, being gay in Singapore is finally legal. So I haven't been legal for most part of my life and I've only started being legal in Singapore last year. Basically, that is what the government is saying. So the repeal of 377A um, was an important milestone in terms of sexual revolution in Singapore. So when we compare Singapore's timeline and when we compare India's timeline, one would expect that Singapore would be very progressive, but then again, when I look at India's timeline, there is so much that we as a country can learn from India. So how do we, how do we move to a place or a state where we can help others in, in, in the community that we live in or in the classrooms that we teach? How can we help our students? So I believe in critical pedagogy in an involved classroom. So what I have here is five branches of what a critical pedagogy in an involved classroom would look like in terms of planning, executing, and getting there. So this is just something that I have done before and I have done it successfully um, in the education field that I am in. And I would like to share with you so that later in the workshopping, it is something that I would like you to try on your own as well. All right. So in terms of the planning stage, I believe in approaches to language art lesson using what I call the twisted fairy tale. So I'm going to share with you a book that I have used. It is a picture book, but it is very empowering. Uh, actually, okay, I, I realize you can't really see the picture. So the title of the book is Seriously Silly Stories, the Collection. I've also included it in my suggested reading at the end of my slide, so you can see it later. So what this book does is that it is a compilation of fairy tales, but it makes it twisted. So for example, one of the stories that I really like and my students enjoy is Cinder Boy. So it is based on a famous fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen, Cinderella, a girl, a poor girl who became a princess. And it is the normative story of any society where a, a small little girl is saved by a prince. But in this uh, twisted fairy tale, the main character became a boy. So a boy, and how the boy needed help. So that is questioning gender norm. That is questioning uh, expected uh, gender behavior and how, and how in the later part, it is the female character who became the protagonist who saved the day, who became the hero who saved the day. So stories like that that we share with our students is very empowering and it has very empowering messages because one, it makes them think about, huh, is this what it's supposed to be? Can it be better? If you're a female student and you're listening to such stories or you're reading such stories, you will question yourself, can I be the one to be the hero? Can I make changes to the society that, life, that I live in? Can I question the role I have been assigned and make better of my life? And if you're the boy, uh, if you're a boy or if you're, or if you're a male student listening to the story, you may not feel that I have to shoulder the whole burden on, on me. I, I, it is okay to be vulnerable. It is okay to need help. It is okay to ask for help. So you're exposing students that 
to, to, to values that is different, you're questioning what societal norm is in terms of gender stereotypes. Okay. So if you are an educator, then the engagement for educator is to encourage conversations and discussions that a student lacked. So you may ask a question and get students to think about their roles, what they can do in turn. Of course, if you're students, then you want to have deeper understanding of social issues. You ask questions, you question the news that are publicly shared. Because remember, when earlier when I discussed about key terms, when we live in a society where we are not allowed or we are discouraged from questioning the government and every news that is being uh, aired out there would have been censored. So then we start questioning the news and we start thinking beyond what is given to us. So we develop our own critical thinking skills and we question the norm that is again insisted upon us. As a society in general, greater community involvement uh, stronger ties with internationals, like what we are doing right now, stronger ties with international, having international discussion, creating community of practices. These are ways that we can engage in critical pedagogy so as to be in an evolved classroom. And of course, the future direction, the end goal is to change mindsets, to have parliamentary discussions on policy, which Singapore is making baby steps working towards where we are trying to get students to be involved in parliamentary discussions, not so much on policies, but to get students to think and get their opinion on the field. So I guess that is Singapore making baby steps. So uh, that being said, I would like us to try our workshop, which will be again led by the audience. So let's workshop together, where you try, I try, and we try together. So I am going to use this template, right, which I shared earlier. And you can think about your own planning. How would you like your critical pedagogy in your evolved classroom look like? What can you do? What would the planning look like? Uh, and the various uh, engagement of educators, engagement with students, engagement with society and future direction. What would that look like? So I'll give you about, uh, we don't have much time, so I'll give you about five minutes to think about it. And then I'll also share another slide where you can reflect on how your responses can uh, you can make further changes to your responses as you think about it. So maybe about five minutes and then I will um, come back and then share with you another reflective slides. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. So five minutes about 12.25. Um, so sorry, yes. No, yes, please. Yeah, at, at any point if you have questions, you may also post it in the chat and then I will uh, talk about it while others is doing the reflection, that's fine too. So I'd request all the participants to please take part in this workshop. And then if you have to talk, uh, discuss something, you can unmute yourself. We have also enabled the chat for the while, so uh, you may also share your ideas there. <laughs>
so Edda, before the participants uh, go ahead with it, uh, I have a small query. So in this critical pedagogy, uh, can we use, like we have a lot of, uh, say, epics. We have epics, Mahabharata and Ramayana. So there are a lot of gender retellings of these. Uh, so can we use this in the classrooms as well? So to explain in uh, gender roles, how gender roles can, it's very fluid. Uh, so these epics, which are usually narrated from a very patriarchal point of view. So these writers, uh, they twist, like you said, the gender roles, like the fairy tale Cinderella you mentioned. So we could also use it, right, to make it culturally specific as well. Yes, of course. So the thing about it is that it's general. I made sure it's general because in Singapore we're very diverse as well. Um, yes, so you can use any of your own cultural fairy tales and you can twist it to change the setting, to change the character or to change the ending to empower a particular uh, community that you want to teach the student about. And then you can encourage them and invite them to write their own story and make the changes themselves. So then they can visualize and see, yes, I could be that character. I could be the one doing it. Yes, definitely. Yes, it's, this is very interesting. Thank you. All right, anyone else would like to, to share something they have thought about or uh, that was very little time actually in the classroom I would give my student at least 40 minutes, but um, anyone has any question at this point? Okay, if not, I'm going to go to the reflective part. Okay, so this is the part where, um, okay, so earlier at the very beginning of this sharing, I actually shared with you my positionality. I was very open about my positionality. So when we're talking about critical pedagogy in a classroom, we also have to act, we also have to acknowledge where we come from, right? Because in a classroom, it is always perceived that the teacher is in a higher place and the student is in a lower place. But then it's not true because sometimes when we share our positionality, we realize that we are all the same, right? So I would invite you to think about your own positionality, who you are in terms of your gender, in terms of your orientation, in terms of the roles you play in society. Maybe you're a mother, maybe you're a daughter, you're a niece, you're a nephew, um, maybe you're a husband, you're a brother, you're a father, you're an uncle, you're an auntie. You can play so many roles. You're a teacher, um, you're the dean. What, what kind of roles do you play in society? And you, you may notice that in certain roles, you have higher power than others. Maybe in certain roles, you have lesser power than others. How do you choose to share that power? Is how you can go back to thinking about the planning, the execution, the role that you play. So when you reflect on this, Okay, and then it is also important to think about your own lived experience. Like I shared with you my marginalized lived experience, how I have used my lived experience to empower the students that I work with, to empower the community that I was in, and how can the, your own lived experience add value to your students or add value to the community that uh, uh, you work with. So this goes slide 17 and slide 18 goes together so slide 17 is your planning and slide 18 would be something that you would think and reflect and then you will continue to make changes to your planning in slide 17 so it's just something for your own resources and it also uh, is exactly what i did with you as i did my sharing so i just walk you through my sharing and then i gave you the resources so that you may do it yourself okay so how do we get there? So I just provide one example so that you can add on to your own. So my example is that my objective at the beginning of every semester is to create a safe and inclusive classroom. So my plan of action, I engage students in the teaching and learning by co-constructing learning outcomes for the rest of the semester. It doesn't take much time. It only takes the first day of the teaching semester for me. So I will actually co-construct with my student teaching and learning what we hope to achieve at the end of the semester. I'll be transparent with them and I will tell them these are the assignments you're required to submit at the end of the semester. These are uh, and how can we get there? How can I help you get there? 
So then they will negotiate, oh, maybe we need this, maybe we need more consultation at this point, maybe we need to talk more, maybe we need more time for this. So we negotiate all of that and we agree on it at the start of the semester. And then we will go through the semester together. So in such a classroom, I'm also letting them know this is safe, this is inclusive. I don't have any more power than you, even though I'm the teacher. I'm sharing this knowledge, this power with you. So you negotiate with me. And we come to a compromise and we agree and we carry on the lesson for the rest of the semester. So it doesn't take very long, just the first day of each teaching semester. And with that, I will leave you with this quote. What is education reform? So education is an arena for discovering one's talent. Education is also to provide equal opportunity to all. But we must always think about equity and equality. Everyone talks about equality and wants to make it equal. But what happened then in my third quote? The underlying notion that those who fail to measure up only have themselves to blame. But what happened when the starting line differs for every student? So when we forget about equity and we only talk about equality, we must always bear in mind that not all students start on the same starting line. Some start way below. What can we do to help the students? Then we are also looking at equity. And we are giving them not an advantage at the starting point, but to help them get to the same starting point. Um, these are some of the books that I looked at. So the first book was the one that I shared, if you're interested in Twisted Fairy Tale. The second book uh, is a chapter that I wrote, if you're interested in reading it. It looks at queer and normal and it actually looks at uh, Singapore sex education curriculum, comparing it to the US, so it's a global comparison, and how I have used the US as a more progressive state and to help Singapore get there. Um, the third is a book that I'm currently reading. It's really good. Uh, it's on sexual revolution. I would encourage you to read it as well. And the fourth is a link if you would like to have a look. It is a link that I work with a group of other queer teachers in Singapore and we came up with this guide to help other educators in Singapore um, help students who are gender non-conforming in their classroom. So it is a guidebook that is available online and I invite you to also have a look and maybe adapt it to the classrooms that, that you have or even use it if you know somebody who might, uh, who might really appreciate the help that you can give them. Um, yeah, so that's all I have for you in this sharing. Uh, that is my email if you have any questions or if you're shy to ask questions or if you would like um, to have the, some of the materials I shared today or even um, to collaborate and work further on other projects, that is the email that I go by and you're most welcome to drop me an email. Um, I think I exceeded the time by two minutes, I'm so sorry. But if, if there is time for question and if there's any question, I'm most happy to answer it. Thank you so much, Dr. Nance. We do have time for questions for oh, okay. 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I thought I was supposed to end at um, three minutes ago, but yes, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, great. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, okay, let me get to the chat. I believe I have to close this and go to the chat. Um, let me... I think my computer just jammed a bit. Oh, I could read out the questions. Uh, uh, okay, I think it, oh, the first question is, as society, uh, Sanjoy, right? Thank you for your question. As society progresses, we see sexual revolution in every sphere of society. Are the LGBTQ people gaining the same importance in society? Somehow, near Thank you so much, Sanjoy, for that question. Um, I feel that even though um, the LGBTQ people are starting to gain visibility in the society that we live in compared to say 10, 20 years ago, but they are still not having, they're still not sharing that rights with other gender conforming or majority of the society. And this is why 
uh, for example, in Singapore, we still have Pink Dot. So Pink Dot this year, the message is about family. Um, even though being queer is now legal in Singapore, queer people are not allowed to get married. So there is still no rights to, to housing, to hospitality, to, to buying a home, to, to, to children. You cannot adopt children if you are queer. So in that sense, you cannot form a family. So what happened then when 30 years from now, when I, you know, when I can't, my eyesight is not very good and I'm aging, I wouldn't have any kids. I wouldn't have any kids to pass it on to, for example. So I feel that even though LGBTQ people are gaining more visibility, people are talking about LGBTQ people, people are discussing the rights, but they are still behind in terms of gaining equal rights, in terms of gaining access to very basic needs in society. I wouldn't say they are neglected. I would say that they are not equal yet. So we are still working on equity. How do we do that? Because I think suicide rate in any country for LGBTQ uh, youth is quite high, including in Singapore. Yeah, because of the abandonment and the rejection from family and just the whole self-doubt that you are just wrong, which is very sad. But thank you so much for that question. Um, he too close to home, but good thing I, I didn't get too emotional about it. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, don't you think that the chief proposition of pedagogy of the oppressed are produced from US controlled academia? Um, yes. And do we need to conceptualize such theories in very different ways? Yes, we do. Which is why I, I myself, when I apply it to Singapore, so the first time I applied it was actually a comparative global study between Singapore and the US sexual education system. So that is one of the links that I suggested for the suggested reading where how I, I demonstrate I applied it to a very different context because Singapore and US is very different. But then somehow I've taken something that is so crushing and I made it into something positive. So I've applied it in a different context. So it's just about looking at a glass of water and looking at it as half full instead of half empty. So yeah, basically I've taken the theory, I've tore it apart and I've applied it to the context that I that I live in. Good, great questions. Uh, hello ma'am. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Anne. So I was wondering when we were talking about uh, the first time when we meet the students and creating a safe space for them in the first class when we laid on the basics. Uh, so as someone who's also teaching, I find it very difficult because uh, as a woman, uh, at times you just, there is also a gender imbalance that happens uh, when you have male students in class. Uh, at times they do realize that they have an upper hand in some ways. Uh, so dealing with that kind of becomes difficult. So when we in uh, say theory know that there are certain things that we can do to make it more democratized and more involved. But when it comes to practice, it becomes a little difficult because you're still grappling with a lot of other things. And in India, it's not just about gender it's also other equations that come in uh, the regions pe where people come from there's class there's caste so it becomes a little difficult when you kind of think of it and navigating that becomes like a line landmine of sorts so just wondering like how do we bridge the gap between theory and practice because even though we do rail down the rules but then we realize we have to improvise as situations come because there are situations where we may not have thought of so just putting it out there yes thank you and for your question i think um i i may not be in a position that you're in but i have experienced something similar so i was teaching in the us for a bit um, as you can see, I'm mixed, so I'm not really white, white. Uh, so when I was teaching in the US, I do have white male students. Uh, I was teaching actually a master's level class. I was teaching a class of future teachers. They were going to teach in public school in the US. So it was a, a writing class. I specialize in teaching writing classes. So then I was, we were going through it and um, I had two white male students who were of course younger than me, but they were big. 
and they were male and they were white and that gave them power in the society that I was in then. So they actually put their legs up on the table. And what I chose to do at that moment was I knew that I had to negotiate that power, but without negotiating that power. So I can either confront them, which is not good, because when you confront them, you are caught in this situation and you don't want to be. And you may or may not win that situation. So you don't want to do that. So what I chose to do instead was I carried on with the lesson as though they did not put their feet up. And eventually, I mean, it wasn't at the end of that lesson. I think it took me like a few more lessons before they finally opened up and they actually acknowledged me and they said, Prof, we need your help in an assignment. So that was the moment where I knew the class was okay. In fact, I had been manhandled when I was in the US. So that time I was volunteering at a middle school, uh, but middle school boys are big. So I was actually part of this No Child Left Behind program, which is a policy statewide where we help students who are behind from everyone else because of their race or immigration status and other reasons. So I had this, uh, uh, he was in the seventh grade, which means that he was about 14, 15. And I was going down the steps. It was snowing. The steps were really slippery. He just carried me and moved me down two steps and he put me down. I was manhandled and I didn't react because I'm really tiny compared to the boys in the US. I didn't react. I just and the next day when I went to school, I just spoke to him like normal. And then the winter break, he actually wished me Merry Christmas. So I think in a situation where we know that we are marginalized because of our intersectionality, maybe our caste and our race and our gender and everything else, even size sometimes, even age. Um, when you look too young, ageism works against you and you look very young as well. Uh, so sometimes we're just, the men just take over. What we can do is we cannot act violently against them because we will never win so we have to be calm at that point and carry on so that the majority of the class can benefit and eventually when they see that majority of the classes are with us they will open up at least this has been my experience in my many years of teaching i've taught in primary secondary junior colleges and university and i've taught overseas and this has been my experience but of course it is not something that will happen overnight those are not pretty experience so i hope that uh, we can talk more about this and we can share our experiences because when we share our experiences specific situation we can actually empower each other and I will probably learn things that you have tried that may have been successful. So I would love to keep in touch with you and, and, and work on this because it is very real. Every semester, it is very real. I'm actually a very tiny person. I'm like uh, 1.6, very, very tiny and people are like really big. And when it comes to white men or white boys, they are way taller than me. Yeah, so it's a very real thing. And in Singapore, because I'm mixed, so I am not of a majority race, but I'm not of a minority race either. People can never put me anywhere. So they're just like, what is she? Not even who is she, it's what is she? So yeah, I, I get that. Like, yeah. But we have to talk more because this is an ongoing thing. So I hope we can keep in touch and discuss more and share with each other um, our approaches and our strategies. Thank you for bringing it up. It's so true. It's what I struggle with every semester too. Yeah. Any other questions? That um, um, We do have time for a few more questions. If you are free, Dr. Nats. Yes, of course. I'm very happy to. Okay. Uh, so we have two more questions in the chat. Okay. Let me see. How are, how are universities or institutes of higher learning posited on this issue of um, um, sexual revolution? So I'm very fortunate in NTU where I work, uh, it took me a lot of courage. And I wasn't legal then, technically based on the law. I actually came out to my to the people who interviewed me that I was, I was genderqueer. And then I told them that it is up to them if they were to hire me. 
I showed them my research, my publication, what I have done, and the awards I have won in terms of teaching. So this is what they're hiring me for, for my abilities. Uh, so they were made aware that I was that I am queer and they hired me based on my abilities. So that was to my advantage. But uh, I will also share with you something bad that happened during my course of teaching with NTU. So I actually had a group of students who petitioned against having me removed because of my queerness. But the school actually took a stand and said that I was hired for my teaching and my research and I will stay. So I guess that is schools, my school, NTU stand on this matter, which is, I would say, very positive uh, compared to maybe how it might play out maybe 20 years ago. Because I wouldn't say 10 years ago, because this, this incident happened like just a few years ago, less than five years ago, maybe about three, four years ago. Yeah. So, so that I think we are making breakway just like the earlier question about the stand on lgbtq we are visible we're making breakway but are we there yet no we still have to work towards it yeah uh thank you and the next question is how do you see the shunning or exchanging traditional gender roles in a classroom where the mode of teaching and learning is more traditional in nature such as the toll run by a religious institution that that is a that is a great question, and uh, I'm sorry that is not something I am experienced in because we are not a we are not a state run by religious leaders. But I did read up on it. My wife is actually um, my wife is actually Singaporean Indian, so I did run through my slides with her, and she did suggest to me that um, India do have religious leaders uh, having a lot of say. Um, I am not sure, but from what I, I heard from my wife, uh, religious leaders do have a lot of say in the running of the states in, in India. I was wondering whether it can be, a Fanonian safe space can be created where healthy debate and negotiation can take place. I'm not sure whether this is possible, but I believe that it is something we can all work towards. So Angie, I'm not sure your full name, Angie, I hope we can talk more about this because it is something that I am very, very interested in, in researching, in working towards. This always creating that safe space, that, that safe uh, conversations that need to take place. And I think when we come with, uh, when, we, when we have that conversation and we enter that safe space, knowing that what we're presenting to them it is based on facts and data people are not going to open up immediately but they are more likely to think about it this is what i i believe in in moving forward in in this today's world i think um i do not have a similar experience the closest to that would be how um, LGBTQ people fight for gay rights in, in Singapore. Uh, it was a no for many years. We were always being rejected. And then we had to present facts, fall back on facts. And then we started to create a space for conversation. But this is something I would love to, to continue to talk about and maybe uh, write something about it together. So Angie, if you could get in touch with me, I'll be very happy to work on this with you because it is too close to my heart and it's very close to my research. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it is very important to, to, to see how we can create that phenomenon safe space for conversations that is not about I'm going to attack you but based on facts and research and peaceful and negotiating and finding that common ground that will benefit all parties. Conversation is never about winning, it's about everybody wins, not about one person winning. So, yeah. Yeah, I hope we can continue to talk about it. Maybe I will learn a lot from you and maybe add on to my own research as well. Yeah. Any any other questions? Uh, hi. Can you hear hi. me? Am I audible? Hi. Yes. Yes, hi. yes. Hi. Hi, Idla. I am Konkana. Okay, so I have a question. Usually in Indian context, we see that you no know, students are not interested to learn anything, especially uh, in the disciplines 
which are not humanities and social sciences for example students from management or engineering or non humanities students they are only driven by a higher ctc and they are only persuaded by the capitalist desires of living a good and wealthy life okay so in such a context what should we do in the classrooms because they only want a higher ctc job and they are not interested in any kind of you know social sciences stuff so what to do in that context Okay, what I would suggest is based on my own experience. So I do have students like that every semester, right? Students who are in engineering, students who are in business, they're not inter interested in writing at all. So very interestingly, and please don't judge me on this, but this is exactly what I did. So I was teaching a research writing class and I told my students, besides the reading you have to do, what else are you interested in? So students told me they're interested in topics like pornography, prostitution, and I say, go research on it. Go interview a group of prostitutes and find out their rights. What are they not getting? Go watch pornography. See the rating. What are more popular? Why do you think it's popular? And then they came up with research papers based on the topics they're truly interested in. And I was really surprised. So they did. So they actually found out about pornography and the rights of of. Uh, uh, men and women, and I even had a student who managed to get one of uh, her paper. Uh, she wrote on prostitution. She says that's what she was interested in. In the end, her paper was writing on uh, how male prostitute was getting way lesser than female prostitute, and so she was very surprised at how her own paper turned out to be when I allowed her to do the topic that she's. She wants to do that, wouldn't that she wouldn't be able to do otherwise? So sometimes we have students in the classroom who are only interested in grades and and what they can make the most money of. But students also are very diverse; they have other interests. So get them to pursue those interests and then get them to write on it. That's what I did, and it became wow! I was so I was so impressed, and I shared with my colleague, and they were like, "You let them write on such topics," and I'm like, "Yes," and you'll be surprised; they wrote research paper on it. They were so interested, they were like, Dr. Nals, I want to meet with you, I want to discuss with you about my paper. Yes, let's talk about it. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good way. That's a good way to arouse the interest. Uh, but, you know, but still I feel that in the long run, they think that, okay, those things should and only matter to us, which serves the our purpose and which gives us maximum profit. So, you know, the <laughs> so, you know, we have to fight it, the capitalists. Uh, doctrines also, which are at play, because I think that everything nowadays society is driven by all the capitalist intentions and motives. But it's yes. very difficult to fight with those, uh, you know, doctrines and ideals. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> well, I'm time... such an educationist, so I believe in using education for you know, like I believe that yes, I always, I, I never, I never ever tell them it's not important to to make money. It's always important to make money and make sure your degree counts towards something. But what is beyond that degree? And I'm also very honest in sharing with them how much of my degree actually matters. Sure, I got a scholarship from the US, I got a scholarship from the Singapore government. But when you, when you peel all of that, what do you have? Who are you? So that's why I always um, share with them where I come from my marginalized position and not so much of this credential that they see it is one thing yeah but I'm, they always surprise me when they give me something more than what i <laughs> so i always have to keep an open mind like okay i might i might read something else and yeah that is right i also keep doing the same but yes when as an educationist and with your teaching uh, style at some point we also find ourselves marginalized because yes. when you see that within a group, you are only doing that. Yes. So, so again, as you said, this is an ongoing journey and we have yeah. to take up the challenge. Yes. Let's keep trying. I believe in that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. Yes. Um, let me see. I think I have a question. How does one deal with sensitive topic? Sensitive topic. Uh, maybe you would like to share a little bit more. I have a message from uh, Vandana uh, who says about sensitive topic. Uh, what kind of sensitive topic are you talking about? Because I do have a uh, quite sensitive topic that students talk about as I've shared, right? Prostitution and, and pornography. Sensitive topic, but we, we talk about it because I always emphasize to them that this is a safe space and inclusive uh, classroom. No one is going to judge anyone. That's how I, I do it. But uh, 
maybe these are other sensitive topics that um, maybe you would like to share what kind of sensitive topic it is and then maybe we can strategize on uh, the sensitivity of the topic or if it's too sensitive you can also like personal message me email me i'm very happy to talk about it yeah yeah um. ah very nice i have another one do we have time we do have time for two more questions okay mm -hmm. all right i have one from maria a uh, very very interesting uh about uh, more diverse gender binaries when it comes to issues like dress codes and such. Uh, this is very lovely. So I have a lot of DDAM students in my class and I do encourage them to dress and be comfortable because I believe that when they are comfortable, they uh, are more willing to learn and they will excel. So I have, um, again, crossing boundaries here, I, have a, I had a student, DDAM, who actually performed in drag shows in Singapore, uh, which was then not legal. Um, and I encourage them to write about it, and they did. So they talk about clubs being safe spaces for drag performance, because in the first place, being drag it wasn't like really legal status then. So and I actually went to watch the performance, and I encourage them to, to do it. And uh, my student has graduated uh, top of their class. So I think we have to be encouraging. So their presentation and research paper was about drag spaces so came in to present dress in drag and because i was encouraging the students was open and encouraging as well so that was a very beautiful moment for me and of course the research paper got, got published as well about uh clubs being safe spaces safe drag spaces it was beautiful it was very beautifully written so yes i would I would like to encourage you, if you're a student, to, to be comfortable and to first, of course, uh, tell your teacher, if you're a student, tell your teacher that you are non-binary and you have to be comfortable and that's when the safe space come in to have conversation, Fanoni and safe space to discuss and negotiate your boundaries. And if you're a teacher, I hope you can respect that safe space and provide that safe space for your student. Yeah. I, I do have students who come in and they tell me their data and I have to respect that they are. Yeah. So I always um, uh, wear a, a pride pin uh, for, for every conference and every class to say that I'm inclusive and I, I accept you. I, not only I accept you, I love you for who you are. Acceptance is one thing, but loving and embracing another person for who they are is also important. And students can feel that. Yeah. Uh, aren't these ethical issues? Ethical issues? What do you mean by ethical issues? I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Hi. Uh, so, uh, so when you uh, you know allow students, especially in an Indian context and all, um, openly they would they might be some ethical issues if you know you promote students to work on topics like prostitution. Or, oh, no, no, we you know, don't or, promote. Uh, we allow them if they want to. Huh. No, but even in that, in such a regard, uh, in an Indian scenario, I think it is very difficult. Um, you know, even though the teacher and the student population who are interested to work might not have any problem, uh, but uh, when you are discussing such a topic in a common front, uh, there might be issues. Uh, you know, from uh, from institution or you know from students or if parents get to know even they might have issues so how as a professor how do you deal with such regards because um, I'm like coming from social sciences like anthropology background we do read as you know students and all so we, I have read as a student on Agoras on you know a lot of other things and all so it's fascinating but how do you get that uh, you know especially in a forum where, you know, as one of the other professors said, it's predominantly a technology institute where maximum number of students are not exposed to such topics and all, and who do not understand the uh, importance of understanding these topics. Like, how do you deal with that? 
Okay, um, so besides my own teaching, I also work with Tomasic Foundation. So Tomasic Foundation is one of the main governing body in Singapore. So every year I work with student scholars on this program uh, locally and internationally. So what I do when, because I'm always uh, in charge of doing culture, identity, gender diversity, topics like that, very controversial identity topics. What I do is that I will share readings diverse types of readings. I will expose students to this type of readings. So once students read, then what I will do is that I will always have it student-led, where students will are encouraged, are invited to share their views on the reading. And that's when I will assess. So I will listen to everyone's view, but always make clear that this is a safe space. We must respect one another's view and they will be different from yours and it doesn't matter. So we we'll listen. We listened and we have one conversation at any one time, so there will not be any attacks on anyone. So that's what I would normally do. I would I would expose them to a diverse of reading, uh, readings that I super love, reading that I don't quite agree, but I still expose them to it. So then you will have students with very diverse view, but they will agree with something. Some students will agree with something because they're very diverse types of readings. And then that's when you fill them out. And then you have to make a decision because at the same time, as much as we want to create this safe space for students, we also want to create a safe space for ourselves. That's very important as well. Yeah. So then that's when you, you when, when students are voicing their views one conversation at a time, then that's when you can see where the conversation is going and then uh, give your views on it and try to create. So this is your opportunity for the Fanonian safe space to come in, to try to create conversation that ensures that every student is safe, no matter what their views, their opinion that take on a certain subject matter. So even if they disagree with each other, it's perfectly okay because that's where the debate comes in. But they have to disagree politely and back it up with facts. So it is never, you know, rule. It is always encouraging that, that conversation. So I always try to encourage that conversations. I have taught primary school students where I told them to write a topic on examination should be abolished. And then I got them to make posters and then put it around the school and gave a, a talk, a hall talk. So parents were like, Miss um, Niles, how come you got my kid to write examination should be abolished? So then I say, maybe you need to listen to what your kids have to say. So the kids actually say they learn so much when it's a happy classroom, a lot more than when they have to sit down for an exam. So I guess it's um, it's about putting, exposing and then letting students speak because I think students always surprise me when I made it student-led. I always listen to what they have to say. And then we put in our parts because we want to keep ourselves safe also. As much as we want to keep the students safe, we also want to keep ourselves safe. So I understand what you mean by um, the worry about the institution. But we must always remember that we must not go against uh, institution policies. So I think it was a good question to ask earlier. Somebody asked me what is um, NTU's take or what is the institution take on this? Yeah. So I think when we are transparent and we are honest, I think it helps. Or at least it has helped me. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, can I ask one more question? Yes, yes, someone has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to switch on my video. From uh, ma'am, from my experience, it's, uh, it's the other way around. I think as a generation, uh, our students are more sensitized than like my generation, like even the uh, millennials per se. Um, and uh, personally, I learned a lot of things from them rather than from my peer group. And uh, but one of the things um, when I think about all, talking about all this thing, when it comes to policy changes, like I don't know how it is about uh, those things in your country. But I think it's also about sensitizing teachers, right? It's not just like we should know about it rather than uh, before we talk about it. So how much you were successful to bring these things in the policy level, not in the classroom? Uh, in India, if you ask me honestly, it's very difficult right now. Uh, but isn't it that important? If that um, is there, then even we can talk about it. Say, this is there, that's why I'm talking about it. Uh, rather than an activist being an activist teacher, if it is there in the policy, uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great question. So that's why I started with the definition more than fascism, right? Um, yes, yeah, so Singapore is a state where 
um, you're not allowed. <laughs> I was being nice when I say you're discouraged. You're not allowed to talk against the government. So when I do discuss policies, uh, I will put the policies out there and then I will get students to talk about it first. I will, I will get their feel, their take on it and um, students with their exposure to a lot of things like what you say, sometimes we learn from them, right? The exposure to internet, their reading is so vast. They might surprise you and they might actually say something that is totally radical and then it allows for the engaging discussion. So sometimes I feel that when I just share a policy, they will be the one to talk about it. They will be the one to offer their views and then it allows for that discussion and then everyone contributes. That's what I find it to be. Uh, I've never had it gotten out of hand, but I will normally end it off with something positive on, uh, on that discussion. I will normally tie it up with something positive. So what Singapore has done is that they have uh, encouraged conversations. University students attend dialogue sessions with uh, invited ministers and then they talk about certain topics like the recent one I went to they talk about death penalty LGBTQ and um, I think another one was something to do with economic finance or something yeah so so students ask the questions like there was a presentation student asked question questions were addressed so it is always good I feel it is always safe as well to protect ourselves uh, by just providing the facts and then encouraging the conversations with students. Because sometimes even when students have opposing views, they were actually they are, we're actually exposing them to something that they may not have thought about. And it gives them an opportunity to then go think about it. Yeah. But I will always try to end the conversation before students leave because I think it's very important before they leave the classroom to have something positive to take away and think about. Yeah, so that's what I will do. And that's what I've always done in, in my own classroom. But I do I do encourage um, that kind of conversations. I do. Yeah. You don't have to be controversial about it because you're just sharing a policy. That is already out there. It is a, a fact. It is a known knowledge. You're not putting your opinion on that policy. And you're allowing students to talk about it. So they're just giving their views on it. That's all. And because you have created on the first day, uh, so it's very important to create a safe classroom right on the first day. You have already created that first day environment so students feel less scared to share. Yeah. And keep emphasizing on that throughout the semester that this is safe. So that will encourage students to talk. Yeah. I hope that mm, kind of... Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Because that's what I do. Mean. If I can ask, like, even if you use, like, they as a pronoun in the classroom that could itself bring a lot of changes like i have seen it uh, then uh, as you said a lot of people will come and students will come and talk to you because they also feel like there is someone who can actually talk to um, yeah thank you thank you for that thank you so uh, does anyone have any other question or Okay, uh, so as much as I would love to continue this session, Dr. Nance, uh, we have a paper presentation, a panel coming up. Uh, so uh, I'd just like to wrap this up. And uh, of course, uh, before this, uh, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful discussion, a wonderful start to the three day virtual session. Uh, it's always good to have uh, these are the spaces where you have uncomfortable discussions, uh, difficult discussions. Uh, so it's always great to uh, go ahead with it. Uh, so uh, Dr. Nas touched upon radical discussions, uncomfortable discussions in educational spaces, legal rights, policy making, uh, wonderful timeline comparison of India and Singapore, uh, classrooms also very our lived experiences inside classrooms outside classrooms even the fact that the size of the faculty matters race intersectionality everything comes into picture in classrooms when it comes to gender and also the retellings how could you use materials retellings of uh, folk tales or fairy tales to use it 
and so uh, you touched upon a lot of things a lot of things we don't usually talk about making uh, most importantly inclusive spaces for the students as well as for us uh, do we have to become more progressive or learn from the students as well as students learning from us uh, uh, thank you so much we are we would be eternally grateful to you dr nels uh, also uh, if taya ma'am is around uh, we would yeah, also Yes, thank so, you so much. That was a very informative and profound session. I really am indebted to you, Dr. Nars, for your time, for your patience, for your affection, and we hope to connect with you uh, soon over a period of time. I was thinking of a workshop that we could do with our students and uh, your students, if possible. Uh, we would be getting in touch with you soon on that. Thank you so please much. do, please do. Yeah, I'm teaching you a class called Straight or Slanted next semester, so I will have all sorts of discussion. Sure. Thank you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. yes. Uh, Dr. Niles and all the participants who had wonderful question to ask you are eternally indebted as Thaya ma'am said. Uh, Dr. Niles, we also invite you to join any of the sessions whenever you are free. Also the plenary session we have in the evening starts at 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Please, it's the same link. Please do join us. We'd love to have you any of the sessions, whichever you want. To Thank join. you so much. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Niles. We'll keep in touch with you. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so that was a wonderful plenary session. Uh, I absolutely enjoyed it. I hope you all did as well. Thank you for such active participation. It sets the ground for the rest of the conference. Uh, we will take a five minutes break. I know it's a little late for the first plenary session. We we'll take a five minutes break and start the first uh, first panel of paper sessions. All right. Be with us at ten forty-five. We are going to start sharp at ten forty-five. Thank you for your patience. Uh, with all the technical issues in the beginning and everything else. Thank you so much.
Dr. Anne Mary George, are you here? I'm here. We'll start in a minute. Sure. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we'll start our first session, uh, session one of paper presentations. Uh, I cordially welcome Dr. Anne George. Uh, she's an assistant professor at VIT AP University. Uh, she, uh, her research interests areas are cinema studies. And uh, the today's session is named as, uh, first session is global context. And we have uh, paper presenters from India and abroad. So, uh, Dr. Anne Mary George, please take it. Thank you, Dr. Anandita. Uh, so, welcome to the first session of the conference, which is titled Global Context. Uh, so, as we are running short of time and we have seven papers in this session, so uh, I just explain how it would go. Uh, people would present the papers and uh, each paper would be presented for about 10 minutes. And after we are done with the presentations, uh, we can have a session for question and answers because having a question answer session after every presentation may just prolong it. So I request the participants if they have any questions uh, when a person is presenting papers, just to uh, make a note of it. And we can address these questions towards the end of the session. Uh, so, without further ado, we'll just start with the first paper of the session. Uh, the first paper is by Dr. Sapna Dogar, who is an assistant professor at the Department of English at the Atal Bihari Vajpayee Government Degree College, Suni in Shimla. And she has obtained her MPhil and PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University. Dr. Sapna's uh, paper is titled Web Comics and Feminism, a study of Rachita Taneja's Santri Panels. Santri Panels is an Indian web comic, which is by an artist called Rachita Taneja, which offers a commentary on social justice issues, including victim blaming and discrimination. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sapna is looking at how the issues of patriarchy and uh, the issues of patriarchy are dealt with in this particular paper and how the artist makes a dig at it unapologetically. Dr. Sapna, I invite you for the talk. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Ma'am, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Please confirm, is my screen visible? Uh, this is the brochure that we are seeing right now and not the... Okay, I'll just... Yes, ma'am, we can, yes, we can see the screen. Right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, ma'am. The title of my presentation is Web Comics and Feminism, a study of Rachita Taneja's sanitary panel. Gone are the days when mythological figures, magicians, witches, demons populated the world of comics. Today's cartoons address politics, caste, gender, society, culture, LGBTQ, environmentalism, net neutrality, and other topics in their fresh and radical online persona. Sanitary Panels is an Indian web comic by artist Rachita Taneja. And this panel offers commentary on social justice issues, including victim blaming, discrimination, hypocrisy, harassment, from a distinctly feminist perspective. She even talks about taboo subjects like homophobia, menstruation, sexual abuse, etc. 
She launched her web comics on Facebook in 2014, and since then she has amassed over thousands of followers on various social networking sites. What is unique about her style is the use of stick figure art style. It is through the trope of humor that she brings forth her point. And this paper discusses some of her feminist panels. In this presentation, I'll only be looking at two. Uh, the paper discusses more of them and their subversive qualities. The paper looks closely at the issue of patriarchy and how Taneja manages to take a dig at it unapologetically. Now, she's also the co-founder of, Rachita Taneja is also the co-founder of Internet uh, Freedom Foundation, which advocates for net neutrality, privacy, and free speech on the internet. And she reportedly attended the Obama Foundation's town hall in New Delhi in 2017. And this is her words. According to Taneja, Sanitary Panel is a feminist webcomic that comments on culture, society, and politics. Sanitary Panels is active on social media through both Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. From mental health to social issues to humor, the webcomic covers a di diverse range of issues using simple, predominantly black and white stick figures that she manually creates using pen and paper. Now, if you look at the title, Sanitary Panels, and this is the logo of Sanitary Pad with, of course, blood on it. And uh, this was the time when students, 2014 was the time when students were being arrested for posting their political opinions on Facebook and generally on the internet. So her comics were in response to that. And when it comes to the name, she just wanted it to be confrontational and she wanted to reflect the kind of work she'd be doing, which is to address taboos and she also wanted to make uncles feel a little uncomfortable. Taneja calls her comic sanitary panels because she wanted her cartoons to break taboos. Again, her quote on patriarchy, patriarchy doesn't disappear online and the IT cell people who come after me are men. The topic of marital rape is in the spotlight and innumerable men are against criminalizing it because they want to continue having power over women. They want to continue whatever they're able to do in marriage. This is how just a patriarchal society works. Men don't want to give up any of their power. And without that happening, women can't have more power. There has to be a balance. When questioned that what are her views on art for art's sake, she says that I believe all art is political. And even the art that isn't political is making a political point. I just think this concept is meaningless. Art is supposed to move you. Now, these are, I'll be using two of her illustrations, first on sexual harassment. So here there is a conversation between two ladies. One says, my workplace has a zero tolerance uh, policy on sexual harassment. The other one says, great. And then the first one corrects it, qualifies it by saying, no, it's zero tolerance to complaints against sexual harassment. So here social commentary masquerades as a web comic and makes us rethink many of our assumptions. This comic explores aspects of gender and technology, including discrimination faced by women in STEM, education, and careers. Taneja says that she uses stick figures because they are simple and effective way of communication. The second illustration. Now, this is uh, what she believes, that if you post something against men on Facebook, it is immediately taken off. But if there are rape threats coming to an artist, then Facebook doesn't find anything, uh, uh, doesn't find it uh, unnerving and, and will not uh, take it down as well. So she says, you reported the following comment, fuck you slut, I will rape you and then kill you slowly. So these are the kind of comments that an artist would get on the Facebook posts. Unfortunately, this comment doesn't violate a standard community. This is what Facebook says. But we did notice your comment that men are trash. And that's deeply offensive, don't you think? So we've temporarily blocked your account. So you think twice before posting that next time. Basically, they're trying to say that you think twice before posting something against men the next time. So Taneja tweeted saying, update, my comment has been taken down on Instagram and Facebook both. This is wild. I'm not allowed to criticize Facebook, but they have no problems when I get rape threats. So there are many such stick, uh, such illustrations that I've talked about in my paper, but for the presentation, only two were selected. So in conclusion, we can say that Rachita Taneja's work aims to empower others to speak up about the issues facing them on a daily basis and to challenge societal taboos. She says she wanted to urge people to speak their mind because that's what I'm going, I'm doing through my work as well.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sapna. Uh, so, uh, as mentioned, uh, we will have the discussions towards the end. Uh, I request others uh, also, if you have questions, to make a note of it. Uh, so, the second paper for the, uh, for the panel is titled Feminine Sensibilities in Jeb Nimka's Novel, Temporary Answers and Overview. This paper is authored by three participants, uh, Dr. Taya Afsal, who is currently the Associate Dean at the School of Social Sciences and Humanities at VIT AP Amravati. Her PhD doctoral dissertation explored the new genre of food studies. She is also a founding member of VIT AP University and has been instrumental in designing curriculum and setting standards for the teaching learning experience on campus. The second uh, author to the paper is Dr. K. Shaheen, who is currently working as an assistant professor at Mandapali Institute of Technology and Science, which is affiliated to the Jawaharlal Nehru in Technical University, Anantapur. Her areas of interest include British literature, Indian writing in English, gender studies, and a uh, special emphasis on human relationship. The third author of the paper is Dr. P. Bashir Khan, who is currently working as an assistant professor at JNTUA College of Engineering Kalkiri, which is a constituent college of Jawaharlal Nehru Technical University, Anantapur. Uh, this paper uh, explores Jen Nimka's novel, Temporary Answers, and dem which demonstrate women's significant role and responsibilities in society, emphasizing that women should be granted equal status, define the constraints of tra uh, tradition, gender discrimination, and humility. Uh, so I invite the presenters uh, to present their paper. Uh, Dr. Bashir, uh, Dr. Shaheen. Well, I think they are experiencing technical issues. We'll just wait for a minute uh, if the participants don't respond. Uh, we can come back to them later. Just give me a minute. Dr. Bashid, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, Dr. Hear? Bashid. Yeah, good morning, madam. I'm sorry. Uh, could you please arrange my session uh, after the while for tomorrow? Sorry, I have some glitches here. Okay. I connect the monitor, uh, computer system. I think network okay. issue. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, is uh, Dr. Pallavi here? I think Dr. Pallavi is also not here. Uh, Ms. Harisini? Harinishri, sorry. I'm, I'm here. Okay. Okay, okay. fine. So uh, we just move on to the fourth paper on the in the panel. This is a paper that is presented by uh, Ms. Har Harishri V and Dr. Vineet Radhakrishnan. And their paper is titled Investigating Hierarchical Interactions Between Hegemonic and Non-Hegemonic Masculinities During the American Civil War. Ms. Harini Shri V is currently pursuing her doctoral studies at the School of Social Sciences and Languages at Vellore Institute of Technology, Chennai. Her area of interest include contemporary Indian theater and gender studies. Uh, Dr. Vineet Radhakrishnan is presently working as an assistant professor at the School of Social Sciences and Languages at Vellore Institute of Technology, Chennai. His areas of specialization include eco-masculinity, 
gender studies, environmental studies, comparative literature, and technical communication. Uh, this paper uh, explores or employs the methods of intersectionality to explore the subtlety of hierarchical, sorry, hierarchical interactions between the dominant and the subaltern communities. Uh, they are discussing a novel called The Sweetness of Water, written by American novelist Nathan Harris. Ms. Uh, Harnishri, I request you to begin the presentation. For the introduction, I'll share the My screen screen visible. Yes, your screen is visible. So much. Um, so good morning, the respected dignitaries, and to the professors and scholars who have gathered here. This is Harini Shri, a research scholar from Bellur Institute of Technology, Chennai. And the paper that I am going to present here is co-authored by Dr. Vinay Radha Krishnan, my research supervisor assistant professor from Bellur Institute of Technology, Chennai. The working title of my paper is Investigating Hierarchical Interactions Between Hegemonic and Non-Hegemonic Masculinities During the American Civil War. So uh, talking about masculinity and hierarchy, um, we all know how the categorization of masculinity has been done by R.W. Cunnell. She is a phenomenal scholar, Australian sociologist, who has uh, penned a rudimentary book on masculinities, which has been published in 1995. And she has categorized masculinities into four, uh, uh, into four divisions, uh, which includes hegemonic, complicit, marginalized, and subordinate masculinities. So to talk about hegemonic masculinities, we all know how the word hegemony has been in function uh, in this literary forum so far. That is, hegemony as an element has been discovered, has been uh, discussed by uh, Antonio Gramsci in his work, Cultural Hegemony. Taking a cue from that, Kanal has uh, categorized a masculinity on hegemony, which can be called as hegemonic masculinity, which talks about the various categories of domination. What you are seeing in the image has certain uh, has described certain qualities on hegemonic masculinity, which includes heterosexuality, whiteness, physical strength, suppression of emotions such as sadness. But uh, in a more contemporary sense, uh, to be very fair, this heterosexuality is the sustainable element in this hegemonic masculinity, and this idea of hegemonic masculinity has evolved itself so in so far that it includes dominations at any level which has been operated by the oppressor. So uh, hegemonic masculinity can be attributed in a contemporary sense. It can be attributed to both the black and white masculinity or even the brown masculinities in India. And talking about complicit masculinity, they can be also called as complex masculinity. They are part of hegemonic masculinity. The difference is that they don't want to show any sort of domination towards the people, but they are ready enough to uh, enjoy the privilege of hegemonic masculinity. So this is a means to say that I'm a part of the group. I don't do anything to be a part of it. The, um, uh, the perks of whatever the group is doing would be enjoyed by me. That's what this complicit masculinity is all about. And the third one in this pyramid is marginalized masculinity, which talks about the men, uh, which talks about men who are racially, ethnic, uh, ethnically oppressed. And uh, they will be the victims of all sort of dominations uh, um, impl uh, implicated by the hegemonic masculinities. And the last and most, um, for mo the last division in this pyramid is subordinate masculinity, which talks about the men who are effeminate and who are gay. I mean, 
the men who feels that their sexuality is different they would come under the subordinate masculinity and moving on to the construction of hegemonic masculinities i have uh, given two pictures here to give a detailed view about how this hegemonic masculinity is actually functioning to be very fair this hegemonic masculinity has been categorized into internal hegemonic masculinity and external hegemonic masculinity by a scholar called Christensen uh, in his article combining hegemonic masculinity and intersectionality. And that's where he is talking about how intersectionality becomes an inclusive term, becomes an inclusive term for the black community people to uh, research upon. And talking about uh, uh, elaborating the idea given in the image, hegemonic masculinity, masculinities are considered to be both the producers and the products of history, the colonial history that they are embedded with. And the uh, divisions that I have given here in the below, that is traditional masculinities and hybrid masculinities, they are also a part of hegemonic masculinity, but in between them, there are certain other masculinities that we need to acknowledge and they were resistant masculinities, instrumental masculinities, feminized masculinities. And these inclusive uh, ideology, which is based on both the capital and habit habitus in terms of power and symbolic violence, explores the idea of hegemonic masculinity in general. And uh, to be more specific, in the next, next to this diagram, we have one cyclical diagram, which is based on the idea of patriarchy, how hegemonic masculinity becomes the subset of patriarchy in this, uh, but, uh, in this idea of masculinity in itself. So it talks about how the gender has been socializing so far and the social reproduction of patriarchy and the inequalities that they are experiencing in terms of power and privilege. They are also becoming part of this cyclical process of patriarchal society. And thereby, this hegemonic masculinity cannot suspend themselves from being a part of patriarchy. And um, uh, talking about uh, the review of literature, I have taken nearly six articles to analyze how this interaction between hegemonic and non-hegemonic masculinity is ha happening. So to start with, the first article focuses on how the psychoanalysis as a co concept can be brought in in order to analyze the non-hegemonic form of masculinities relying within the hegemonic forum. And the second article talks about uh, exploring the vertical structures of power using horizontal logics of variations that we could find in masculinities. And the third article talks about the idea of care, because what uh, differentiates hegemonic from non-hegemonic masculinity is the idea of care and ignorance of power. So this uh, idea of care uh, uh, incorporated by non-hegemonic masculinity can be um, analyzed in terms of aesthetic literary, philological uh, aspect, or philosophical aspects, or even social scientific uh, aspects using the constructions and discourses that we are trying to analyze uh, in that particular uh, arena. And the fourth uh, article talks about how the, uh, this is about queerness, because what I am taking as a frame of reference is actually uh, dealing with queer narrative too. So I have taken this article to particularly know how this idea of uh, gay relationship plays an important role in subordinate masculinity. So it talks about male rape, how male rape is legitimated in an unequal relationship between men. That is, we all know in a relationship, one person will always be on, on the upper level and one would always be supported. And with respect to gays, uh, the, uh, this has become a problem because one uh, would all, uh, this is not about, uh, I'm not very generic in uh, saying about gay relationships. This is about what the uh, narrative that I have taken as a frame of reference 
that is sweetness of water. So here we could find one man as a perpetrator and the another one as victim. So my analysis is highly limited with respect to the novel that I have taken. And the fifth article that uh, I have taken talks about monologic and dialogic nature of masculinities in the grand inclusive framework of intersectionality. How the deviations of hegemonic and non-hegemonic men can be explored in a wider um, uh, in a wider uh, in a, on a wider scale. And the sixth article talks about the dynamics that we could find in a traditional masculinity who refuses to come out of the stereotypicality that they have already established. And the research gap that I have found from the articles that I have read and also with respect to the frame of reference is uh, slavery. Uh, which has been executed in plantations uh, where analyzed uh, on a very surface level, that is, they, they have just analyzed about the relationship between colonizer and colonized. But on a deeper level, we must know there are certain psychological angles to which we need to uh, analyze this idea of colonizer and colonized, um, except the lens of power and privilege. I mean, leaving that lens of power and privilege. And I have also uh, um, told you that uh, this novel is going to deal with, uh, deal with another subplot of poor people. So I'll also be uh, taking that into consideration in order to acknowledge actions happening between hegemonic and non-hegemonic men represented in this novel. So moving on to the frame of reference that I have, that I have taken, this, uh, this text is written by Nathan Harris, that is The Sweetness of Water. And this is his uh, first novel. And uh, it, is, it was his debut as a writer in a liter literature field. And uh, this novel has backed several prizes uh, and even the Booker Prize. Uh, and it has been long listed for the 2021 Booker Prize too. And um, it features the emancipation proclamation policy that is included uh, in that is introduced by Lincoln in dealing with the life uh, in uh, talking about the life of slave people. And it also talks about the subplot of two male gay Confederate soldiers uh, who has been uh, in relationship. And this is set in fictional locale of old ox, old ox. And uh, this novel is slightly imitating, is slightly an attempt to imitate the known world written by Edward P. Jones. And we have certain characters here, Prentice and Blandy, they are freed, freedmen, but they are black masculinities who are going to work in the field of George Walker. George Walker is a white man and uh, his wife is Isabel Walker and how they are going to uh, accommodate themselves with this black men. Uh, is forms the left uh, forms the rest of the plot, and we have other characters who are Caleb Walker and August. Uh, Caleb Walker is the son of George Walker and Isabel Walker, and he and his best friend August uh, were in a relationship. And August is the son of Wade Webler and Ted Morton, General Class, and Sheriff Haxton. These minor characters form the mainstream of how this uh, domination of heterosexual hegemonic masculinity can be studied so uh, this is the general uh, this is the um, uh, pictorial rep depiction of how this plot is involving if you could uh, see my cursor moving this is the uh, main uh, just a minute this is the main place where we'll be dealing with uh, this is the major place where the entire plot is happening that is in walker's ranch otherwise we have certain other characters who forms the part of uh, this um, grand uh, grand scheme of things. And we have only one black man depicted here. Otherwise, whatever has been uh, drawn is, uh, is where white men and white people. So with only one black man in this plot, uh, in this picture, you could understand how the sort of minority has been, uh, how the plight of minority has been executed. And moving on to the methodological framework, I have taken two uh, ideas to analyze this intra these interactions. That is uh, R.W. Uh, Colonel's Masculinities. Uh, uh, this is a book, by the way, but there are certain elements that we can uh, discover within this book, which helps us to analyze uh, how the slavery has been functioned during the American Civil War. And we have another theory, intersectionality, a gender theory, by the way. 
so to know how uh, how the uh, how uh, the elements of race class culture gender forms a uh, forms a network in categorizing men according to their standards so the research questions because this is working article i have uh, but taken two research questions to be analyzed that is how the how do power dynamics play an important role in hierarchy existing between different forms of masculinity and how does queerness contradict heterosexual hegemonic masculinities these are the two research questions and my research objectives are as follows that is to explore the salient features of racial hierarchy to analyze the power relations of the empire here empire i mean both british and american but here i am particularly dealing with american so to the uh, the another objective is to investigate the role of gender masculinity in the american civil war so moving on to the core of my uh, paper that is gender masculinity here uh, gender masculinity they were categorized to be the hegemonic men they are uh, perfect hegemonic masculinity for uh, who are standing as the order to uh, all the non hegemonic men existing in this plot so the inter uh, here i have taken different sort of intersection it's not about race class culture and gender it's all about intersectional behaviors and intersectional characteristics that i found between these these three characters that is ted morton wade webler and uh, general class uh, and sheriff hackstead too so uh, they uh, form a uh, they uh, are actually constructing the idea of hegemonic masculinity here and the commonalities that we can find here is their direct involvement in violence and how they are uh, being the breadwinners of family dominating the uh, entire community as such and they um, uh they possess domestic authority over women they share a very brutal relationship with the agricultural workers that means with the slaves that they are uh the with the slaves who are working under them and uh, the second one is uh, non hegemonic masculinity here i uh, i am going to deal with four different kinds of masculinity uh which has been classified under non hegemonic masculinity first one is george walker who being a part of um, a uh, patriarchal divider he uh, actually enjoys the privileges but he don't want to impose any power over his workers that is prentis and landry who came to work in his fields so um, there is another character that is caleb walker whose uh, i whose uh, sexuality is completely different from these men and he being a gay has been subjected to many critics uh, many uh, sorts of violence and that he was uh, he was uh, uh, very numb and uh, he was not able to stand up for himself that's the uh, uh, that's the pity of caleb walker being a white man and uh, we have another two characters prentice and landry who who uh, who were uh, uh, changing themselves completely that is their character has been evolved from being a marginal masculinity uh, that is prentis being a marginal masculinity because his brother landry died he becomes a powerful man at the end but this powerful uh, powerfulness that we cannot uh, we cannot sense it while we read the plot only by the end of this novel will come to realize how independent that he feels after everything so there are some shift of identities that uh, over towards the end of the novel prentis and caleb walker they were just uh, categorized into one uh, uh, one um, stream that uh, they uh, believe that they are independent now so uh, here we can have some intersectional framework between prentis as a white black masculinity and caleb as a white masculinity embracing the independent idea of independence so uh, these are the uh, current results that i could come across when i um, when i am try when i tried analyzing the interactions that is marginal masculinities uh, they are constructed to discourse and power but it can be subjected to change according to the situations that they are facing and uh, the second result is uh, though uh, george walker has been reduced to the position of being a non hegemonic man and he he was being dominated by certain group of men who were hegemonic so this non hegemonic they cannot wither themselves away from uh, getting dominated by people 
somehow or other there is domination there is a domination which is always existing and the third one is a hinge model which talks about the uh, empowerment of rentals how uh, black masculinities are trying to re-racialize themselves in order to elevate their positions to the uh, authorized level of white masculinity so uh, these are the scope and limitations of my paper scope is that we can um, uh, explore some poor trends which has been mentioned this in this novel i'm yet to explore it because this is working article and uh, another scope is i have uh, done very limited analysis on how this gently role of gently masculinities has been functioning in this colonized network maybe in a post colonial sense it might def, uh, it might differ so we uh, we have a, we have some scope to analyze gentry masculinities too so the limitation is that this uh, analysis is limited to only a single frame of reference and talking about male body with respect to gay um, masculinities i have not done that that is the limitation of my paper and these are the references that i have taken and i thank the organizers for the opportunity to present you Thank you, Ms. Harinishri. Uh, we will have a discussion on your paper after towards the end of the session. Uh, the next presentation we have uh, is by Dr. Anand Rabari, who is a faculty at the Department of English at the Institute of Letter and Languages at Magina University Center, Algeria. Dr. Rabari's uh, paper focuses on males and females' identities and language, mainly in English literature. The paper explores the world of English women and investigates the main aspects surrounding their identity, culture, and language use. The focal point of this paper is centered on the linguistic devices that females employ to express their identity and position in English society. I invite Dr. Rabari to make the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, President, dear uh, uh, women, honorable members of the organizing and the scientific county and the esteemed audience, good morning. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to ask you, is my screen full? We can't see your screen yet, it's blank. Yeah? yeah. It is full? Um, no, we can't see your screen. Uh, okay, no. Okay. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Yeah? Is yeah, we can see it. Okay, nice. Yes. Yes. Is my screen full now? Yeah, it is a full screen. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think, uh, oh, ladies and gentlemen, doctors, professor, I think that you all agree with me that broadly speaking, the first thing we notice when we meet people is not their clothes, their voice, their eyes, or even their smile, that is what gender they are. So the division of human race into male and female is so fundamental and obvious that we take for granted. So it is lexicalized in all the languages of the world in terms of tales such as man versus woman, boy versus girl, and son versus daughter, isn't it? It's also agreed that linguists and sociolinguists prefer to remain aloof from literary discourse because they think it is unworthy of investigation since it represents half of reality and is far behind what exists in society. This leads to the lack of scholarship that explores the use of literary discourse on other parameters such as gender. Consequently, uh, uh, consequently, many researchers in the field of sociolinguistics and gender studies have turned their attention towards the study of gender representation in literary texts, although there exists a lack of theories that probe gender not only in literary texts, but also in real life. In this vein, the focal point behind the current research work is to have a best eye view of gender differences in relation to linguistic and social parameters, including social class, education, and language use in Pygmalion and Tom Jones. 
Secondly, it endeavors to study the status of both males and females in these societies that, that are related to language differences and topics like love, marriage, prestige, and education. Lastly, it strives to analyze the sociocultural background of these societies in the hope of helping probe the differences between the societies and to see whether 18th century England has changed in its social structure or not. So to this end, the following research questions spring from the previous objectives. We have firstly, do both authors differ in representing gender in their literary works? Secondly, how do they represent gender differences in both Pygmalion and Tom Jones? And lastly, what are the most discussed topics presented in these two masterpieces? In this regard, these research questions are hypothesized as follows. The representation of gender differs largely in both novels. Secondly, the position of women in English society is the central theme in Pygmalion and Tom Jones. And lastly, education, marriage, and class differences are the main topics in both novels. Consequently, data are collected from chains of speech from the characters' communication with each other, mainly the protagonist Tom, Sophia, Higgins, and Eliza. Then we shift towards analyzing discourse markers, the use of polite forms, hedges, tag questions, and tag questions according to lack of categorization, hoping that this may help in identifying the linguistic features that distinguish males and female speech in the English society of the 18th and 19th centuries. As a matter of fact, the sample was selected from Pygmalion, which is wrote by George Bernard Shaw and Tom Jones by Henry Folding, depending on certain sociolinguistic parameters, mainly gender, education, and social class. As far as, uh, as, far as the, uh, the findings are concerned, the analysis demonstrates that the aforementioned novels have some some in some common points and differ in others. So the differences between Pygmalion and Tom Jones differ in what follows. Firstly, the literary texts at hand differ in their representation of gender roles, the setting of the stories and the topics being tackled. Secondly, they differ in representing language use to gender roles and class differences. And lastly, we can say that Henry Folding concentrates on marriage in relation to class, while George Bernard Shaw gives much importance to education and its status between males and females. Although these literary genre of works differ in some points, they share this some common features, among which we have Firstly, they attracted the reader's attention to the status of females in English society from the 18th until the 19th centuries. Henry Fielding and Cho focus on cultural differences between characters and how social class differences are deeply interrelated between them. And lastly, both authors tend to employ discourse markers and linguistic categorization to show gender differences in terms of language use although they differ in terms of gender realm representation. In this vein, the following recommendations are the sum of the previous findings. The present research work attempts to explore the use of language in relation to gender roles, hoping to create a model that helps researchers study literary discourse regarding gender social attitudes, language variation, and cultural perspectives of the societies being investigated. This may permit readers, linguists, and stylists to delve in into the events of the literary text and understand the cultural background of the author's societies. Uh, to wrap it up, it is helpful to state that examining a literary text through the study of its main components, starting with its socio-cultural background, education, gender, 
social norms and values are of significant importance in developing an image of the society under investigation, because these features do not represent the author's point of view, but rather draw a panoramic image about his time. Thus, for this work intends to build a communicative bridge between sociolinguistics and literature that might be helpful to understand the code of each society's culture. In the end, thank you very much for your considerable attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rabari. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, so moving on to the next paper. Uh, the next paper is titled Gender-Based Violence in Fiction by Pakistani Women Writers. Uh, this paper will be presented by Dr. Amreen Shahadi, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Gender Studies at the University of Punjab, Lahore. Uh, this paper explores works of women fiction writers of Pakistan, focusing on the themes of gender-based violence uh, and uh, which are not just limited to sexual, physical, psychological, and emotional violence, but also other forms of violence. And is also exploring why most of these novels uh, are focusing on violence on women and not uh, violence done by women on men. So I invite Dr. Shah Amreen to make her presentation. Thank you so much. Congratulations to the organizers uh, to organize such a you know great conference. I must say. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. You can. All right. I'm sharing it. Can you confirm when it is visible for you? Oh, we can see your screen. All right. So, um, as uh, already told, uh, the paper is titled as Gender-Based Violence in Fiction by Pakistani Women Writer. And uh, I'm also, you know, introduced by the uh, worthy chair. Um, the research paper explores works of women fiction writers and the uh, Garvey theory has been used in this qualitative research to explore texts. Uh, themes of gender-based violence are extracted through thematic analysis. And I'm just uh, being very brief about the methodology and want to you know, jump to the findings and uh, my, uh, you know, some conclusions. Um, I have uh, also uh, given some photographs of women writers here, and you must see that it's Mr. Chokai and Kuratul and Heather are here as well. And there is a reason for that. I know uh, Kuratul and Heather uh, left for uh, India back in 1961, and Mr. Chokai also was um, uh, there, and uh, because um, uh, I have included them here because of um, because I want to make a point. So I will come to that. Uh, all right. So violence is diverse in its nature and it cannot be seen in isolation. It has to be seen in relation to many other factors. For example, relationship, gender, class, caste, ethnicity, religion, etc. So gender-based violence comprises of and is not limited to physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, and me mental, etc. So the idea is to take gender-based violence as a complex notion and view the diverse manifestations as these appear or not appear in select work of uh, writers included in this study. Gender plays an important role in understanding the dynamics of violence. Gender makes experience of violence profound and complex. It is incorrect to ignore a person's gender while trying to understand violence because this intersectionality of gender and violence makes an experience of violence unique. Also, when gender-based violence intersects with other factors like class, race, ethnicity, and religion, etc., the peculiarity of the experience becomes more understandable. Uh, I have used the theoretical lens of patriarchy, and uh, as we know, uh, as we've seen uh, some uh, seminal works and works of theorists like Foucault, Camus, Kafka, Heidel, etc., violence belongs to men's realm. And uh, that is why this theoretical lens is used here. Um, as far as the review of literature is concerned, um, I have seen that 
the uh, the narrations of acts of violence against women by men, uh, men in all their forms have been presented in many works of literature throughout the world. And uh, some of uh, it has also been, but most of it has also been taken as their exaggerations by many critics. But there are uh, also many important works um, across, um, uh, you know, re uh, different regions and times um, that have been uh, done as regards to, you know, exploring works of, uh, on, uh, as regards to violence in literature. But uh, there are less works of fiction representing violence against women or other gender in context with Indian subcontinent, especially on fiction written by women authors. Uh, and uh, images of violence against women mirror the reality of lived experiences of women in texts by women fiction writers. Patriarchy and its interpretations of power dynamics in marriage and relationships is one major reason of this violence against women. Violence against women is the logical consequence of the historical belief of male dominance and masculine power to use force to coerce women to bend their wishes. This, thus, sexism and misogyny prevails. Um, I have uh, talked about uh, different forms of violence, so for example, physical and sexual, gender-based violence, there is mental violence, invisible violence, uh, there is um, uh, uh, some other, uh, there are some other headings as well, I'll come to that, but I will uh, talk about one or two headings in detail, because uh, there won't be so much time, it is um, a very detailed paper that I have written. Uh, as far as physical violence is concerned, it is shown in various ways in fiction, uh, from mild hurting to torture and murder, also from mildly putting atrocious acts of passionately narrating mild acts of physical violence. For example, there is an excerpt from a um, short story by Baba Fixia, where uh, she is talking about uh, um, uh, a girl who is uh, fallen in love, and she is giving the example of uh, Saroop Lakha. Uh, from uh, Ramayan, and she's saying that um, such damsel has no nose, and if there is any left, it is better to cut it, right? So basically, uh, what uh, Barakutse is trying to do here is that uh, there is this um, whole uh, mythological narrative where the, the nose of Sarup Nuka is cut because uh, uh, she has she has been you know proposing to men, and uh, that is actually because she left ego and you can see that uh, a brutal act of actually cutting the nose is presented in such a soft manner in the mask of talk talking about unconditional love that the brutality of the sex is not visible and uh, secondly there is also this thing in my mind that mythology, myth mythological narratives or mythology itself is so much distant in thought that these acts although they are violent don't appear to be real so Kutsia is also using the symbol in um, in many other stories as well. And uh, this uh, um, I have also observed in my uh, you know exploration that uh, women uh, who are writing fiction in subcontinent are using symbols and metaphors from mythology a lot. Then um, uh, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, there is dearth of text by Pakistani women authors which could which could depict physical violence in a direct and clear manner. Though there are many global examples of depiction of violence in an unapologetic way. For example, there is the, the act of rape is a very brutal act. You can see this example by Leela Mehmet Bashir. Um, you can see that uh, she is uh, giving, uh, she is using certain uh, metaphors for uh, men here. Dragons are eating up whole living beings, or it, she has written such things. Like but I would say that if you, uh, you know, you are not giving graphic descriptions. I'm not saying that uh, brutality should be very graphically depicted. But somehow, um, you know, a symbol, a symbolic manner of narrating incidents of rape reduces the intensity of act. And if you are calling men as dogs, fake dragons, termites, etc., that takes the real out of the act. What remains is a distant thought of something painful being done, and the man who does that is not seen as a person who is an abnormal human being inflicting brutality on a woman. Secondly, giving graphic description by women is also very much discouraged, uh, discouraged uh, because narrating brutality done to women makes it easily a pornographic narration that in turn becomes a piece of writing which gives player to the reader at some level, which means eroticizing of violence. And secondly, 
uh, there is another fact that if men write, then it is all right, but if women write, they should not be writing uh, in such a manner. Um, then I have also uh, explored um, the fact that uh, many stories are written on the partition of Indian subcontinent, and there we can see the intersectionality of gender based physical and sexual violence and religion. Uh, that has been a subject of many short stories, and um, you know, Kurapula Hyder, Rita Laka, Tarya, Khadija Mastur wrote Angan, and there are also books of fiction like uh, Masur Zara Zaneen, and there are many, many short stories by, you know, Parvati by Alkanda Lodi, and uh, many other short stories. Uh, Angan does not indulge in narrations or any stories of violence against women. While Masur Zara Zaneen narrates how women were from both sides of the line of partition faced violence during these riots. For example, she writes that father, which daughter are you calling? She was the daughter father. She was the most precious cat from the loot. She will not return in your crying, uh, at your crying. Your wife cannot reach her. And father, the kidnapping of your daughter has been avenged. Many fathers on that side would also be crying like you. Even if the plunder is recovered, it will not be all. So, um, Zadaira writes that when do women of the cities return? Here also, ruined Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh women have been swept under the carpet of freedom with the broom of forgetfulness. So they have just become the ghost of partition. Uh, because losing life and home in a country where indeed uh, they were indeed big losses. But amidst all that was happening, uh, safeguarding the honor or patriarchal honor of family during rights of partition was one added responsibility on the shoulder of those women. Uh, and their gendered bodies. Uh, Rifat wrote uh, a short story, Rifat was a Punjabi short story writer, and um, ironically, when I was reporting photographs of uh, women writers in the sides, and I uh, actually understood this long ago, back into the 2015, when I started working on fiction and literature, that there is no photograph of Rifat available, and she actually stopped writing after she got married, and uh, she was not even socially meeting uh, other writers and poets. So that is another irony that is very much there. But you know, uh, she has uh, talked about a girl here who was lost during partition and later on returned. So she was symbolized as a wound that can never be healed. So elder daughter of my Karima, who was separated during partition and was left in some village of Patiala in India has, has arrived back. It is said that the one who forgetfully leaves in the morning and comes back at night is not called as forgetful. But what sort of a daughter is she who has returned at noon, but no one hugs her smilingly and says, welcome back. But I felt when she was lost, she become, became a sore of the heart. And now she, as she has returned, she has become that sort of a painful wound, which could neither be banished nor left open. So you are crossing the threshold intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, there is this um, an inacceptability of the returning daughter, uh, and that has been affected uh, in many short stories by women writers. Along with the partition violence, family violence was also going on, where women were encouraged to die by jumping in wells, canals, or rivers to save families from the dishonor of getting kidnapped, raped, or killed. This must also be kept in mind that the self sacrifice of women actually is taken as something goddess like, and women are encouraged to suffer different forms of this family violence beautifully wrapped in the garb of a superior act of sacrifice. And uh, we know that there are uh, many other forms of sacrifice in, uh, for family name and honor um, that may include domestic violence or the uh, or sati or jumping in the canals at the time of partition. There can be many such things. And uh, these act are called heroic or beautiful, which actually removes that kind of uh, violating uh, intensity from these acts. So it must be kept in mind that fiction written by part, uh, on partition by male writers gives a more graphic representation of violence. Rai point of specific term for, term for it, calling it as pornography of violence, whereas this cannot be generally said about women writers. Women writers hesitate to outline details of physical or sexual violence. The allegation of indulging in writing, writing pornography or maybe the pornography of violence is not possible for women writers. Um, uh, because uh, one reason may be the same old patriarchal, dogmatic, phallocentric control of the brings, at one hand, the destruction of female bodies through violence and, uh, and violence, and so on. So there are other forms as well. I have talked about physical and sexual violence.
violence. I've talked about this, uh, intersectionality. I've explored mental violence, patriarchy, uh, hegemony, and female body violence against gender rather than women, and invisible violence. Here comes um, why Ismet Chukhtai's photograph is there, because uh, I think Ismet Chukhtai's Leha is the only short story that talks about kind of uh, violence, uh, kind of LGBTQ violence, and there are, uh, uh, as far as women infection rights are concerned, uh, there are no other short stories as such, right? So uh, then there are some conclusions. There are many forms of violence happening in the society every day that have been highlighted to the women fiction writers. And um, they, um, all these examples that they have presented uh, show patriarchal hegemony and ideological control, and also show that patriarchal control is inevitably pervasive. Violence belongs to patriarchal control and thus is a part of women's life. And uh, there are many notable novels uh, and short stories in uh, Partition of Indian Subcontinent, gen they have narrated gender-based physical and sexual violence and how it intersects with religion as well as family violence. It must be careful in mind that family violence um, it can be you know, pinpointed there, but I don't think there is a conscious um, attempt at uh, unfolding this, uh, uh, this cruelty done, on, uh, done by families to women uh, on part of uh, women rights. Uh, then it must also be kept in mind that um, uh, violence inflicted to the rights of partition was deliberate and conscious. In this uh, manner, bodies of women, particularly women, are decorated with acts of violation and violence and control. And this is the dehumanization of women. However, it is an irony, though, that the verbal narratives of partition are very strong, yet the texts written by women authors, though reporting murder, rape, and violence, do not give depictions of acts in a manner that can actually quote the real atrocities. In comparison, a male writer, Sadat has a mental short story gives stronger and graphically impactful images of violence. For example, the short story, Thanda Ghosh, where a man gets a dead minor during rights, a school meeting actually, a Senate to refer to the faceless female corpse that man raped. And Koldo, where an unconscious girl raped several times, starts opening the codes of her trouser on the mere appearance of the world, words cold though that is open so there is still a need to connect the events of violence with male hegemony and patriarchal control violence is a multi-dimensional phenomenon and in recent years it is taking varied forms so there are many types of violence for instance cyber and digital violence which are not yet explored or written about so that's it Let Thank me stop sharing. Yeah, I was trying to be very quick. I I, I hope I was um, clear in communicating, but I wanted to. Thank you, Dr. Amreen. Uh, so it's uh, we've always talk about partition and partition literature from the Indian point of view. So I think for many of us, it's also a different view that we're seeing it from the other side. Uh, so, uh, with this, uh, we'll just open up the floor for questions. If uh, people in the audience have any question for the participants, you can ask them. Okay, uh, while well, I think people are still formulating their questions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Konkra, do hello. you have a question? Yes, yeah. yes, I have a question for the first presenter. Uh, yes, sure. uh, yeah. So I just want to ask uh, the first pre presenter that what are the other issues that uh, Rachita, right? Rachita Taneja talks about in her web comics. Because I understood the crux of your presentation, but I just want to know uh, what else does she Portray in her web comics. Uh, Doctor Sapna. Just 
just a minute. I'll just try texting her. Okay. Ma'am, am I audible? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, you're audible. Uh, Ma'am, Brachita Taneja's web comics look at many issues. I had focused only on patriarchy, but she primarily looks at uh, Modi government. She's anti-Modi. And okay. uh, there was a case against her as well, where she, you know, made an illustration about Arnav Goswami. I never wanted to touch upon these things in this paper, because then the focus word of the paper would have been too vast. But she's very interesting. I only focus on patriarchal aspects, feminist aspects. But if you look at it from the government point of view, political point of view, very interesting, very political work. And her primary work is primarily she deals with anti Modi, uh, you know, it's, uh, I can call it anti Modi or, um, I mean, for lack of any word, I would say. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, that would be a good word. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And I have thank one you. question for the third uh, presenter. Uh, it was a very interesting paper on the masculinity and the hierarchy of masculinities. I really liked the paper. It was very insightful. Uh, so I just want to know and understand more about the hinge model that you talked about. It is uh, very new to me, hinge model. Question is to Ms. Harini. Harini. Yes, Shri. Can you hear me now? Um, yes, yeah, you, yeah. So this hinge model is something which was introduced by R. W. Kanal in our book uh, about the elevation of uh, subaltern masculinity to the mainstream level. And uh, I uh, have taken this sample of uh, this character that is Prentice in that novel. How he is tasting the uh, freedom uh, at the end after so many things that he had faced and that he becomes the sample of the model that is introduced by uh, Colonel Man. I have taken only his character according to which I am discussing certain psychological deviations that he has undergone. And moreover, uh, this inch model is a very generic one. It can be applied to um, any level of masculinity who are trying to evolve from the uh, rudimentary to the uh, to the higher level, I have worked till this. Month. So far, I have worked till this. Okay, it is very interesting. And one more question: I mean, as a researcher and as a social observer, uh, do you see tensions between hegemonic masculinity, between you know subordinate masculinities? Because when we uh, look at the society through a microscopic lens, we feel there are many, many tensions going on uh, despite all these, you know, structures. Do you see that those kinds of tensions? I mean, this is, exactly. I just want to know. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Exactly. I do see some tensions uh, going between these two uh, forms of masculinity. But the problem with masculinity in general is that uh, when we try to categorize masculinity under one categorization, uh, due to their uh, uh, due to their uh, psychological behavior, due to their uh, behavioral elevations, they are trying to be another sort of masculinity. That is, there is a possibility for a hegemonic masculinity to be a non-hegemonic masculinity, and vice versa. So the deviation that I am currently I have currently evidence is something that I'm uh, focusing on, that is something that I'm facing on all sorts of masculinity. I can see the tensions happening between uh, complicit masculinity and hegemonic. I can also see the same tensions happening between uh, complicit and marginalized. So the problem is the degree of domination might vary, but the question of uh, power, the idea of privilege, and the plight of oppression still persists in whatever masculinities that we are taking. Even with the hegemonic masculinity, we have two categorizations, that is external and internal. Uh, external talks about how a man is dominating another man um, and uh, how he is uh, uh, trying to dominate women, actually, uh, um, also how he is dominating women. It is a usual kind of thing in hegemonic masculinity. 
and to talk yeah. about internal um, hegemony uh, this is uh, particularly dealing with patriarchal divides who are trying to find uh, various kinds of differences various kinds of uh, power uh, power dynamic problems within themselves so again it is getting problematized so how how much ever we are trying to deal with it we are coming across very many new ideas that uh, there is a possibility as a researcher i have a possibility uh, to deviate myself from the focus that i have already intended it to be so that is the answer that uh, i believe okay thank you so much for your response because i also you. you know as an observer i also see lots of tensions within the same group within the same category we have lots of new tensions because of diverging thoughts uh, and expectations and social desires so even within the same category of hegemonic masculinity they have a lot of tensions lots of you know conflicting opinions and this leads to lots lots of problems and they fail to cope with that Uh, so this is very interesting paper thank you so much thank you so much for the questions thank you yes that's it thank thank you uh, are there any other questions for the participants okay uh Dr. Salahuddin, there is a question for you in the chat box. Uh, this is uh, the participants asking if you could shed a light on how she would, how you would differentiate male writers such as Manto's description of physical violence towards women during partition riots, uh, with that uh, of more muffled and nuanced way of the female female writers wrote about lost and returned daughters. it is oh, one second in in the course of the same event can the male writer in the case be called uh, in the case be called to be showing insensitiveness towards a subject does perceiving of physical violence be gender specific while writing fictions based on or influenced by the same event uh, yes it is a very interesting question and this is one of my findings indeed that uh, manto what manto wrote he was very uh you know clear and there were indeed some graphic elements i would uh, definitely say that but it was a very uh, you know clear depiction it was a very uh you know it was not uh, a hidden sort of a symbolic sort of a description she he was always showing what was happening in the in the real and factual way or manner i would say so uh, as far as women writers are concerned as i have uh, discussed in my paper that uh, there are these cultural barriers and uh, i also studied uh, conducted this study back in 2015 where i talked to certain readers who were actually students of literature or teachers of literature and they when i presented some excerpts in, uh, to them and they were like oh my god why are women writing like that if there are women they should not be writing like that if there are certain graphic descriptions so these are the things i think that um, it is kind of a conditioning that is very much there and there is a thing that is uh, stopping them from indulging in uh, that sort of uh, discussion so they are not um, really um, empowered in that sense with the pen because there is also this uh, dichotomy of uh, a pen and needle that which instrument is whose to carry so uh, these are all Uh, the things that are very much there i am a writer and poet myself with seven published books and i totally understand uh, how um, these things are discussed as with our women writer that i have been written in this manner and if they are written writing this manner they would say that bada mardana war likha hai you are written like you have written this like a man so uh, what is writing like a man or writing like a woman what has gender to do with writing is unfortunately something very very important to discuss here in the context of this region as um, uh, and uh, obviously if women are writing about returning daughters in this manner that is also coming from the whole philosophy of patriarchal control and hegemony it is the honor of the family that is at stake and patriarchy has something to do with this honor thing you know and um, the honor is at stake whatever if something really 
minute happens with a girl or something really big happens with a girl, the honor is always at stake. And um, I've written a paper on that, uh, intentional and unintentional crossing of Lakshman Rekha. You know, if you are deliberately going out of the four walls of the house or you are kidnapped, it is the same way. It is taken in this, somehow in the same manner. People would pray uh, that their daughter should not return, that she has been outside the home for so long. So uh, obviously, there is some specific thing and gender is very much there. It has something to do. I think I've addressed the question. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so, uh, should we wrap it up, uh, Dr. Anandita? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I would thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to chair the session. Uh, this session has been very interesting. It has brought in a lot of perspectives that I've not really thought about. So usually when we talk about gender, it's mostly talking about uh, masculinity in a different way. So that uh, the idea of gender in the graphic world and how the idea of graphic novels change, uh, the idea of gender and violence in literature, uh, especially uh, the partition literature. And finally, uh, Dr. Rabai's work, which is talking about the idea of gender and language in the works of English literature, are all very interesting. And I think for many of us here is also something that we will go back to think of because there are perspectives we may not have thought of, we have overlooked. So thank you for this uh, session. Uh, over to you, Dr. Anand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. and Baby George. Uh, and or to all the presenters, to Ambri, to Dr. Sapna, Dr. Ambri, uh, Dr. Uh, Hanan Rabahi, uh, to everyone, it was a wonderful set of presentations and discussions as well as uh, truly global context and interdisciplinary. I'm so glad and thankful that you agreed to the time zones and the time we gave you. Thank you so much for being there. I enjoyed the session. Uh, please be there for all the rest of the paper presentations whenever you are free. We'll be in touch with you uh, shortly. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so that being said, uh, we move ahead uh, to the next set of presentations at session two. Our chair, Dr. Pallavi Sana Das, is already here. Uh, so uh, a warm welcome to you, Dr. Pallavi Sana Das. And uh, so as uh, the uh, as uh, the panel, as the sessions go ahead, we'll have 10 minutes of presentations. Each presenter will get 10 minutes. After that, there will be a time of 15 to 20 minutes of discussion. This session would run till 1 o'clock. Uh, so um, that's it. All the paper presenters are here. So Dr. Pallavi Sinadas, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting this session. As a chair, uh, I guess we should start with the presentations first so that we uh, get a broad idea of what uh, the papers are all about and then we will discuss. So, the session is on sociological implications of the first paper presented by social care, Dr. Shifaru Jain. Isha, Dr. Vandana and Isha. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am.
Uh, Ma'am, I need uh, the permission to Thank share. You, please. Yes, uh, give us two minutes. Yes, ma'am. Shafali, you may go ahead. No. Isha, you may go ahead with your presentation. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, we can see your slides. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all. I am Isha Gaddu, graduate of Masters of Social Work from Navrachna University. This paper is co-authored with Dr. Vandana Tae Gaukar, Associate Professor at uh, Navrachna University. This paper is based on my master's thesis and the title of this paper is Perception of Aging by Elderly Women. It was during uh, the fieldwork in MSW that I got uh, interested in elderly population and their challenges and hence the paper and this presentation today. So uh, the demographic shift shows that the society is aging according to UNFPA in 2017 it illust uh, the illustration shows that there will be more than uh, more number of elders in the society and um, it is not too distant future that the young india of today will be replaced by the graying society an interesting fact about this is that the number of elderly women uh, is more and it, it is going to increase uh, uh, it is going to increase uh, to 1060 by 2050 and it is said to uh, ha have a result in as a feminization of uh, aging uh, so what is aging according uh, aging is a process of becoming older particularly as people reach late adulthood phase and beyond Aging has been uh, defined as a continuous decline in age-specific traits of fitness caused by the internal physiological degradation. Though aging is a universal process, it varies uh, uh, by the society. It is viewed differently at different stages, uh, at different processes. Overall, aging has an impact of, uh, on the community and at every form of social responsibility, uh, uh, social relationships. So uh, though some challenges of aging are common between men and women, there are few sim uh, there are few different challenges that are faced, uh, which are physical, mental, uh, and social life and uh, relationships. Health has been defined as a complete state of mind, state of physical, mental, social well-being, and not solely the absence of ailment. And the specific challenges which are faced by elderly women in phys physical health are phase of menopause, falls of risk, uh, hearing loss, cataract, diabetes, aging skin and body images, rheumatoid arthritis, hot flashes and osteoporosis with mental health it is uh, depression anxiety dementia loneliness emptiness syndrome uh, sleeping pattern in uh, insomnia memory loss with social health it is social isolation widowhood elderly abuse the relationship amongst the families relatives and their communities uh, wisdom and life satisfaction, old age home, and uh, relationship with the caregivers. So uh, the present study which I did uh, uh, was planned 
and the specific objectives for the study were to study perception of elderly women on uh, aging with respect to their physical mental and social well-being second was to find out the challenges faced by the elderly women due to the aging third was to find out the ways that they cope up with the challenges by elder uh, uh, with the challenges the tools that were used the tool that was used to for the study was questionnaire with uh, which consisted of open ended as well as the closed ended questions the data which was collected uh, by the uh, by the researcher uh, was first by sending the links uh, links of the forms but uh, in a digital way and later on uh, the, the researcher visited the homes uh, the technique which was then used uh, you know uh, to get the to get more participants was this snowballing technique and approximately it took 2 hours for the uh, uh, for uh, for taking the interview at their elderly women's homes and their uh, over the calls uh so date the data obtained from uh, the close ended questions were analyzed by frequency and percentage the data for uh, open ended questions was received in terms of single words and the data was compiled uh, the data was compiled the technique of content analysis was used and wherever needed the frequency was used so for the, from the findings uh, the, the first one was to study the perception of elderly women on aging with respect to the physical well being there were uh, most of the women experienced um, mood swings uh, hor um, hormonal imbalance anxiety uh, temperamental differentiation differences hypertension and osteoporosis when they reached menopause but also had physic uh, but also had a positive experience uh, such as understanding the concept and getting rid of their periods the physical changes that were observed by the elderly women uh, in uh, 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 by the by the elderly women in themselves were unexplained like they had a hair, uh, unexplained hair growth in places there were there was a sort uh, there was sudden weight loss or weight gain so the uh, people uh, elderly women were uh, facing uh, these uh, were suffering through cervical spondylosis bowel and digestion issues joint pain body sagging like wrinkles um most of the elderly women felt uh, young about their age when were, when they were asked about they wanted to look young but did not wish to use any uh, kind of anti aging cream and neither used any anti aging cream at that point of time and the elderly women thought uh, the, the their thoughts were positive because they felt responsible pleased and well experienced for about their age their maturity uh, their maturity rose and they felt good about themselves a few uh, elderly women had both good as well as bad negative thoughts about the graying hair pigmentation aging brought some of the anxieties to them uh, uh, the study of uh, perception of elderly women on aging with respect to mental uh, well being elderly women faced uh, high, high most of the elderly women faced uh, the increase in risk of uh, uh, depression anxiety loneliness social isolation cognitive decline insecurity neglect abuse fear boredom in activity lower uh, self esteem lack of control and poor mental health they also uh, uh, by uh, by the time few of the elderly women were emotionally stable satisfied with their lives they managed their stress by indulging into some or the other activities and they thought they were more wiser and more experienced with their age uh perception uh, studying the perception of elderly women on uh, aging with 
respect to social well being uh, most of the elderly women enjoyed attending while they were asked did they enjoy attending the uh, family gatherings or community meetings they did enjoy as they felt less isolated and they felt better to communicate with their families neighbors and communities they were uh, very much satisfied with their lives and uh, had and have varying relationships with their caregivers some felt good with uh, with their caregivers while others felt burdened some uh, elderly women considered going to old age homes while others just rejected it they did not uh, they did not take that as an opportunity um to find out uh, challenges faced by uh, the elderly women due to aging uh elderly women faced challenges while moving out of their homes like they felt that there, there was a security a safety issue they were let uh, they were, there was lack of literacy there was lack of knowledge regarding how to use these scanners how to use the mobile phones how to uh, how to uh, make online payments uh and facilities like ramps and wheelchairs uh, few felt insulted and embarrassed about their age um uh, to find out the ways of coping with challenges by elderly women uh, most of the elderly women didn't fee, uh, didn't face any of the challenge they were quite comfortable with their financial conditions as well as their head health conditions were pretty good few learned to use mobile phones and were engaged with the social gatherings and often visited the uh, visited religious places um uh, they uh, they were uh, few of them suffered uh, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoporosis but at the same time they, um uh reflection this study was conducted in an urban setting in the tier 3 city vadodara it it is necessary to find out if uh, rural context of urban context uh, of their tie, of the tier uh, the one city will make a difference in the perception of elderly women on aging this is especially for the challenges faced and ways of coping with challenges hence a few studies uh, need to be undertaken to further understand the perception of elderly women on aging uh, thank you thank you isha for shining uh, light on the perception of aging uh, i have few questions uh, which i want yes ma'am First, next paper is written by Mr. Shukla and Dr. Postal, Padma Patel, and Sudeshna Chowdhury. Yeah, I'm here. So your paper is on clinical evaluation. Yeah, your your voice is cracking. Yes, my paper is the same title. so can i start ma'am yeah, hello yes please start. yeah uh, very good afternoon to all my name is dr seema shukla and uh, i'm working in school of modern media upes dehradun and uh, this paper is titled as a critical evaluation of attribution in news stories about rape against women case study for on framing victim blaming in rape crimes and this paper is co-authored with uh, my colleagues dr kostav padmavati and ms sudeshna choudhury so if we see uh, just a second i will see yeah. if you see a uh, typology of a violence it's it's a who thing and they said that the violence are of a three types so first is a self directed second is a interpersonal and third is collective in uh, all types of uh, violence uh, the nature of violence are physical sexual psychological uh, so i am going to talk about the sexual violence against women 
so my uh, presentation outline is introduction objective of the study research methodology res result and discussion and conclusion if you see the data of this is a covid 19 was a very uh, important uh, disease you can say or it's a landmark in our life it changes our life our thinking and everything and this data is pre covid years and a post covid years and we see that the everything like we are, um, the people are not coming because of social isolation and social distancing but still the crime against women are uh, still there and they were increasing in the time of covid-19 also so the aim of this research study is to throw light on the interrelation between portrayal of rape in online news media and the legal awareness it creates in society i have taken mm -hmm. online thing because uh, i have studied the uh, uh, period of covid and uh, during that uh, there was a small lockdown period where newspaper in a hard copy was not available so i have taken online study so the approach i have uh, done here is a mixed method approach so um, i have you i have done the content analysis uh methodology to analyze news articles of rape uh, rape crimes committed against women uh i have used uh, media framing theory approach to analyze the methods and the frequencies in which language in news rape stories uh were uh, um, given or uh, written then i have uh, uh, while framing a questionnaire i then later on i have planned the questionnaire i have framed the questions to do the survey to analyze the impact of these news stories on the awareness level of individual i have used the theory of planned behavior and the content based media exposure scale to analyze the impact of these news stories or uh, news reports on legal awareness of an individual and how they can control or uh, the rape crimes and then i have used the smart pls software to analyze the data just a second uh for uh, to extract the themes uh, used in portrayal of rape crimes in the text of articles and photographs i have uh, you know, find the articles with the help of a google search engine i typed rape and rape crimes and i have taken the period between 2022 to 2021 and the for the survey i have used the sample size of 223 he and which is very appropriate and i have calculated this um, uh, number of uh, uh, population you can say or the respondents with the g power uh, software and uh, then age group i have taken for uh, i have done the survey with the age group of 18 to 35 years of females because this is the highly uh, victim age group and it's uh, given in a ncrp report so i have calculated those things and the found that these uh, terms uh, just a second uh, first is the presence of rape myth with the text or a photographs uh first in the clothing of victim the behavior of victim behavior rape um consumption of alcohol or drug by victim in uh, several reports it's mentioned there then male perpetrator anyone who did not come uh, under stereotypical male or stranger with a weapon or acquaintance rape then terms used in a legal form is a law enforcement like which section is applicable which section is not applicable and how the case will proceed then judges family of friends or neighbors or colleagues terms has been used witness victims lawyer procedure or advocates experts and defendants and if we see the framing of reports is a uh, uh, episodic and thematic or a both so they are both for episodic focused on a one rape committed by the perpetrator and multiple rape crimes done by the same accuser or a group of persons then in a thematic statics of rape crimes prevention or the connections to rape culture or sexism or social institution so rapes so uh, these rape stories are take uh, framing in the form of episodic and thematic and some uh, reports are on the both they are taking the both episodic episodic and thematic uh, after that i have framed the, these questions based on this text what i have got is uh, like how often do you get exposure to media with information of rape crimes uh, media with legal provision associated with the rape crimes media supporting rape myths media with conviction of rape crimes and this is uh, based on the i uh, developed this question i based on the content based media exposure scale 
and then later on um, uh, to see the uh, legal attribution or legal content and the relationship between legal awareness and the intention to control rape crimes or attitude um, i have developed one model which shows that uh, yes attribution of legal contents create legal awareness and the legal awareness uh, leads to intention to control of rape crimes and then leads to at, uh, attitude to control of rape crimes and these, uh, I have proposed these three uh, hypotheses in my research paper. First is the attribution of legal content in the news reports increase the legal awareness of individual. The attribution of legal content has a positive relationship with the intention to control rape crimes. The attribution of legal content has a positive relationship with the attitude to control of rape crimes. And the all uh, this is the data which I got from Smart PLS. And this shows that uh, the T values are pretty high. It's a 2.359 for first hypothesis, 5.201 for second hypothesis, and um, for 5.109 for third hypothesis. So I got all the positive results, results for all three hypotheses, and I got the supported results. So the conclusion says that in some ways, if this is a qualitative data, how they portray so news coverage on websites have changed over the past one decade to reflect a better understanding of rape crimes. The number of reports covering rape and gender-based violence education and awareness campaigns are more prevalent in these days uh, that are leading to the significant societal shift in perspective about the different aspects that play a role in sexual violence against women. The study shows that the framing of rape crimes has made more significant changes since 2012, that is a Nirbhaya case. The results of this research study indicate that portrayal of rape crimes does affect readers or receivers' response. The research study also shows that the legal awareness plays a major role in developing intention and attitude to control rape crimes. And the legal awareness may be increased by providing content related to Indian legalization in Indian media. However, this study also highlights that the area could use improvement and suggestions for further studies. Thank you so much. This is the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, Ma'am, your voice not coming. Thank you, Dr. Seema, for such a wonderful paper and the findings you have from your research. Uh, Thank you so much. Bit, uh, the end. Now, our next paper presented is Shama and M. Priyavan. Yes, ma'am. Can I start sharing my screen? Yeah, please. Um, okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, uh, I am Shyama and uh, I'm a senior research fellow in Department of Criminology. And uh, today I would like to discuss about the topic normalization of domestic violence and intergenerational transmission of violence. So this paper is co-authored with Dr. M. Priyamvada, professor uh, of Department of Criminology. Uh, so according to the United Nations, uh, domestic violence is a pattern of behavior in any relationship that is used to gain or maintain power and control over an intimate partner. Abuse can be uh, physical, sexual, emotional, economic or psychological actions or threats of actions that in influence another person. It is also mentioned that anyone can be a victim of domestic violence regardless of age, race, gender, sexual orientation faith or class even though it is mentioned as uh, it can happen to uh, any gender uh, we can see a pattern that uh, the women uh, women are more uh, victimized in domestic violence and um, i am taking that context here uh, also uh, who has given uh, a similar definition to the for the domestic violence um, and uh, here 
WHO also gives uh, examples of types of behavior, like, such as what constitutes to physical violence, sexual, emotional, and uh, it also mentions about controlling behaviors, uh, such as isolating a person from family and friends, monitoring their movements, restricting access to uh, financial resources, employment, education, or medical care. So when we come to the Indian context, uh, Section 498A was included in the year 1983 to uh, penalize the cruelty that is faced by married women. So uh, it, it, it comes under the title that, that is husband or relative of husband of women subjecting her to cruelty. So uh, it, it the, the definition also give, uh, gives a wider perspective which includes mental or physical that you can see in the explanation part any willful conduct which is of such a nature as is likely to drive the women to commit suicide or to cause grave injury or danger to life limb or health whether mental or physical of the women so uh, ac according to indian penal court the the person who does this to the women is subjected to um, punishment that extends to three years and is also liable to fine so in 2005, uh, a special law that has been enacted to protect women from domestic violence is Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act 2005. So uh, according to this act, uh, in this uh, section three, uh, in the definition of domestic violence is given. Interestingly, uh, we have a very uh, larger and broader definition of uh, domestic violence that is given in this act and uh, if we could um, analyze this act we can see that it, rather than uh, a punitive act it is more of a protective act and it gives different types of orders which is there to protect the women from domestic violence the main focus of the act is to protect the women somehow from the domestic violence and you can see uh, different types of uh, uh, very large explanation is given about domestic violence and uh, a, a very broader uh, definition is given to what constitute to physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal and emotional abuse, as well as uh, economic abuse. And you can see uh, the concept of dowry is also included in this economic abuse part, which is very specific to Indian context. So uh, here we come to the... Uh, major topic of the um, uh, paper normalization of domestic violence so uh, according to crime in india uh, which is published by ncrb in 2021 it is reported that uh, the majority of the cases under crime against women are under 498 that is cruelty by husband or his relatives so uh, we can see that india is uh, we have a patriarchal system and the uh, normalization of domestic violence is very commonly seen and is the product of a patriarchal system. So uh, we can observe that it is widely, uh, domestic violence is widely normalized in our society and uh, tolerating and ignoring violence in a family uh, setup is the expected or the normal response from the society. So uh, if something is happening, you are expected to ignore the violence or tolerate the violence so uh why is it normalized uh even though it is a violence why is it normalized in the family household and in the society as a whole so uh, these are the reasons uh cultural norms uh so they uh they sh uh, the shared social representations and perspectives on gender differences which situated females in an inferior position. And uh, we expect uh, women to be uh, wife, mother, housewife, or abused women in that particular uh, position. Uh, this has been, um, this we can see in the study of Lennon et al. 2021. And uh, also the narratives of masculinity is also uh, very widely affects the normalization of uh, domestic violence. There is also social approval. Uh, violence is approved in the society and it is approved in the um, household or family relations. Also the stereotypical gender roles such as uh, women should work, women shouldn't be independent. All those stereotypical gender roles also play a part in normalizing domestic violence. Also, the victim has um, more fear 
of breaking the family or isolating from the society than the fear of violence. So victim also try to normalize the violence. Also victim uh, try to protect children uh, by ignoring uh, the violence uh, as such. Uh, she is in fear of that uh, it can be affected on children if she is responding. It will break the family and it will also cause so much problems. In that way also, it is normalized. Also, pol policy variables uh, such as the response of the police, uh, response of the justice system, image of the uh, how society or the victim perceives the victim support system. If the victim is perceiving it as not so friendly with the victim, uh, they will not uh, report it or they will not take action against, against it or they will not seek help. And also exposure to family violence in childhood. If you undergo uh, family violence in childhood, you are um, more likely to normalize the, the domestic violence. And also there is cycle of violence, which makes the victim uh, to be confused of the situation, uh, whether to uh, is it normal or not so normal. So as you can see, the cycle of violence, it, it, it's in four stages. Uh, stage one is tension, stage two is violence, stage three is honeymoon, stage four is calm. So once the tension build up in the house, uh, the stress in the victim also increases, then the violence or the incident happens. And then uh, there will be a honeymoon or making it up, like uh, there will be a uh, uh, negotiations happening to make it up to the violence and then there is calm but this is not permanent and this will ha keep on happening in a cycle which makes the victim more confused and um, you know uh, not make them to seek help so how it, the normalization is uh, connected to the intergenerational transfer of violence so uh, according to Bendura uh, in 1971-1973 study uh, in, in the social learning theory, violence, like any other behavior, is learned. So if you are in a household and you see violence on a daily basis, there are high probability that you uh, you learn that behavior, you internalize it, and you use it in your uh, life once you grow up, and you use it in your life on a daily daily basis also. So also, Kalmus 1984 uh, in his study mentioned that history of witnessing Interparental violence by children leads to the enactment of violence in subsequent generations. So what happens to the children in domestic violence? The people, children who uh, see the uh, domestic violence, what happens to them? They model domestic violence. According to Gill and Laurel, uh, the boys who experience domestic violence grow up to identify with the uh, aggressor. And the girls... Uh, identify themselves to the victims and they when they become adults they uh, model that relationship also they internalize violence as a method to deal with conflict they don't know any other methods to deal with the conflicts or uh, you know uh, disagreements so they use violence as a method to deal with it also there is uh, mother blaming when uh, when children are uh, seen that mother is normalizing the violence, they blame the mother and they use it. Uh, they give a different narrative of power also in this thing. Uh, because the family is a main socializing institution, main source of childhood learning aggression model between parents not only provides scripts for violent behaviors, but also teach, teaches appropriateness and, sorry, appropriateness and um, consequences of such behavior in an intimate relationship to children through direct and vicarious reinforcements of rewards and punishment. And uh, this also affects the parenting style of the parents who are in a violent relationship. And this will con also contribute to the upbringing of the children. So this is the uh, cycle that happens uh, through the intergenerational transmission. Uh, this is from the study of Dennis Wilson, 2016. So if you, uh, when you are a child, you witness family violence, and through the society, when you uh, when you look into the society for the response, what kind of response you want to respond to such a situation, you can see that society and the people around you are normalizing it, and you also start to 
normalize uh, you internalize it the no, uh, the normalization you also start to think that it is fine to normalize the violence and then you start to model such an expectation in a relationship you expect this to be happening in a violent relationship and this increases the probability of violence when you encounter when you get into a relationship you also try to uh, you know um start behaving the way that has been uh, seen in your childhood from your um, violent uh, in your violent household so this keeps on going going and going to the next generation and uh, this is not necessary that it will go on forever uh, one uh, one important factor can influence to break this intergeneration transmission that is the in role of intervention so one if there is an in intervention that is happening in between any of this cycle you can break the intergenerational transmission and uh, what why there is a necessity of intervention here it can happen in two stages when uh, i will be going back to the, this thing when you witness the family violence you can intervene or when you are uh, when you expect a similar model of relationship and there is an increased probability of violence at that point of also uh, if you are intervening if, you, if there is an intervention from outside factor then or internally then the transfer of violence through generations can be broken it can happen through formal or informal process formal can be through professional help seeking through counselors or a psychologist or any uh, any other professional help seeking or through informal ways such as if you are meeting with people who who has a different model who has a healthy relationship or some incident that happens that question your models and beliefs about the relationship setups these interventions can break the idea of being violent or normalizing violent so if that intervention doesn't happen the transfer of violence keep on happening so it is necessary to provide uh, intervention whether uh, especially formally so that they can they know to how to handle the situation so <clears throat> essentially when you don't know what you don't know you do what you don't know and what you do no may not be safe or right but you do know any other way uh, so you don't know any other way so you will eventually end up in the violent way so it is essential to learn other way to deal with conflicts and uh, disagreements in a relationship and through intervention only that is possible uh, that's it thank you uh, the domestic violence has actually normalized and normalized in family. Uh, we had first paper presenter who wasn't there, Dr. Shikali Jain. Are you there? Shafali has been facing some technical issues, ma'am. So you could go ahead with the discussion session. Any questions for the paper presenter? Uh, hello yeah. hello yeah am i audible yes uh yes okay so i have a question for the second paper presenter isha guddu i think yes, uh, you talk uh, yeah yeah you talked about the perception of aging uh so i somehow felt that you know uh, the inclination of elderly women to spirituality or engaging in spiritual and religious activities also play a very important role in how they look at aging. I mean, don't you feel so? Because you live in Gujarat, right? So yes, I've seen, I, you know, I, yes, I've seen a lot of elderly women engaging in religious activities, functions very often. And they get a lot of peace uh, through that. And it impacts how they look at spirit, uh, aging. So what is your take on that? And do you think that you should include it in your paper? Mom, I uh, I did include that part, but the problem was I thought it was uh, kind of distracting all the other objectives from uh, uh, the uh, spirit. I mean, spirituality might take over the whole objective, and it might not focus upon the physical and mental well-being more. So <laughs> I did add, but it was a minor part of the uh, paper. So I think I I should have added it. Uh, 
if if it's the suggestion i would like to take it upon and i would make sure that i i add it next time yeah because you know uh, you can just look at it without affecting your objectives because that is a very important uh, aspect to be looked at okay okay thank you so much uh, now i have a question for the third paper presenter dr shima seema shukla seema uh Sh shama you meant uh no i uh, didn't i did not uh, mean shama uh, for the third uh, there's a paper on victim blaming of uh the rape culture media and legal events yes yes yeah, okay so not there. There. i think she is not there okay then i'll move on to shama is it okay yeah please uh, okay Uh, so i liked your paper i mean you have researched very intensively uh, but when we talk about domestic violence uh, there are lots of violence on the men too especially on the disabled men which i have come across in my lifetime i i know that you know when a uh, male with disability uh, they get married or they uh, live in a household with incompatible partners they also go through a lot of domestic violence so i think uh, you know because so, uh, very frequently we utter the word domestic violence and it refers only to women but i think we should take men with disability and other marginalized men also into this category so that we can have a very nuanced understanding of domestic violence and how it impacts the identity and the personhood of those people i mean because you know domestic violence does not mean only on women it can happen to any gender in any identity any group uh yes ma'am i also yes ma'am i also agree that uh, men also undergo uh, domestic violence but according to the statistics women are more uh, victimized so uh, here in my paper i took only that perspective so uh, that doesn't deny the victimization of men and i also agree that there should be more uh, more in depth researches should be done on uh, men with disabilities and uh, men who are marginalized i agree with your uh, you know statement okay fine thank you so much yeah thank you thank you, thank you dr datta for your questions um, i i'll have uh, certain questions with uh, sorry if anyone else have questions with the paper presenters I have question with Disha. Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, Panavi, I still remains to. Ah, uh, due to that. Working, ma'am. Sorry, you're on mute. Please unmute yourself. I guess uh, Dr. Shpali has some uh, technical error uh, glitches. Hello. Yes, please. Hello. Yeah, Dr. Shpali, we can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Can I present my paper now? Do you, yeah, because please. of some technical issues, I was not able to prepare uh, present it now. Yeah, please, you can. Okay, give me two minutes. Uh, can you see my screen now? Not yet. Is my screen visible, ma'am?
Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Valenor. Good afternoon, Valenor. First of all, I'm really sorry for the glitch that happened. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, you. Oops. Good afternoon, Valenor. My name is Dr. Shipali Jain. I'm an assistant professor at Manipal Nanavati Women's College, and my topic is pink tax. Uh, I've divided my paper in three different questions is what, where, and how. First of all, before in talking about pink tax, I want to talk about gender inequality. Being born as a woman in Indian society, one has to face gender discrimination at all levels. At the household level, females are confined to their household chores, raising children and looking after families, irrespective of their education, degree, and job profile. At a workplace, women have limited access to job opportunities and are paid less for the same work. Gender inequality is a pressing issue in our Indian society. It is in spite the constitution that guarantees equal rights for men and women and decades of legislation, some deep-rooted gender discrimination in India takes a brutal toll on women's life. Now my topic is what is paying tax? Pink tax is a type of gender-based pricing discrimination that refers to an intrinsic cost that women incurs when purchasing goods manufactured and promoted exclusively for women as compared to male, made and marketed goods, which are typically less expensive. Pink tax is commonly used to describe a situation where things associated with women are priced higher than those with men. Generally speaking, women pay more than males for similar products. The pink tax is not imposed by government, but the businesses selling the product. The, in economics, the term pink tax cites uh, to pricing practice or government regulation followed in business that in increases the cost of transaction of a woman. The business employs this type of selling in strategy to increase their profit. Pink tax is not visible in every sphere of market, but it is actually underneath the consumer goods, which are frequently bought, bought by both males and females. Gender-based price discrimination is rampant in industry dealing with personal care products, example soap, deodorant, cosmetic apparels, etc. Men and women frequently purchase identical uh, goods every day. However, a study reveals that consumer goods promoted and advertised to women often cost more than equivalent goods offered to men. A pink tech is the term used to describe this inequality. Personal care items are among the industries with the high visibility of gender-based pricing discrepancies. These consist of items like deodorant, soaps, lotions, and razor blades that are sold to either men or women. As per our research, only 23% of uh, persons are aware of the term pink tax and its effects on country's economy. We have a tendency to put males under requirement before females. Therefore, male contraceptives were exempt from tax before they were viewed as a because they were viewed as a necessary. Whereas female health hygiene items like sanitary napkins and tampons were subject to 12 to 14 percent GST. Only after a persistent effort by activists did the Indian government in 2018 reduce reduced the 12 percent GST on sanitary napkins. Given that only a small portion of population uses menstrual the sanitary goods, this would obviously not be the case of pen tax. However, it is as crucial to aware of this harsh tax on necessities because doing so simply increases the pink tax unwarranted financial weight. Where is pink tax found? Several countries have investigated the pink tax, including Argentina, France, Germany, UK, Australia, and Italy, so as in India. In India, we, see, uh, we perceive women with a particular eye. We see them in a, that they should behave in a particular manner. We call them Sundar and Shushir. The women has been objectified deep down since ages. For example, in Ramayana, Sitaji was considered as an ideal for, of womenhood, not because of her qualities of intelligence, tenacity, affection, and resourcefulness, but for merger of her identity with her husband. The idealization has affected generation and developed a set of principles of how women should behave. Women faces this discrimination due to prevalent patriarchal, uh, patriarchal norms. This discrimination starts right from the birth of a child. If a girl child is born, she is symbolized with color pink. And if a male child is born, he is symbolized with color blue. This dissonance affects the buying behavior of the society. For example, when we buy things for infants, we buy them color specific. 
blue for boys and pink for girls and knowingly or unknowingly we get fleeced by the pervasive gender based pricing strategy the pervasiveness is omnipresent in all stages of life i've taken few examples at the infant stage i have taken two similar beddings which are costing differently because based on their color, uh, color. two soft toys which are made up Uh, which are produced by the same product uh, producer but the prices are heavily different Sp- uh, same for the toddlers teenagers adults and in adults we see this price discrimination very frequently for the basic necessity of items for example razors women razors and male razors that razors which for men which, which will cost 4 rupees will cost 10 rupees for a women is just because of its color and for the gender and how pink tax is affecting the society according to international labor organization women work more and are paid less the gender divide is already prevalent in workplace with a limited number of women participating in leadership roles across the sectors the international organization mentioned that gender gap exists in all countries worldwide and globally it has narrowed only a bit in past decade The gender gap is further widened, and a certain ideal and standard of beauty is reinforced when expensive products marketed towards women are mandated. People's mental health might be harmed by not adhering to such aesthetic standards, making them more prone to developing social anxiety disorder, despair, or loneliness. Additionally, the division is made wider by the identification of colors with genders. the ideal that blue is associated with boys and pink is with girls restricts the option available to the two genders and forces to confer to social norms while marginalizing the other gender it was uh, uh, my research methodology for that particular research paper i wanted to know the awareness of pink tricks in, in especially in india and especially among the students and the professors we are teaching them so i have taken a prepare a research uh, questionnaire for that i have taken few uh, parameters age was one of them i have taken the age from 18 to 45 gender male and female both qualification was from graduate level students to post graduate or professionals uh, professionals also i have asked them the question that are you aware of pink tax uh, 76% of population does not know about the term pink tax they are knowingly or unknowingly paying an extra pay, uh, price for a similar product which are marketed for males but they don't know about the particular term pink x do you shop for opposite gender more than 50% of uh, population shops for the opposite gender if you are shopping for opposite gender and if you are shopping for a male that particular product will be price effective for you in respect of a female product how would you ever have you ever came across with the price discrimination policy among male and female everybody is confused that whether they have came across with this pricing policy they have came to know that particular term exists or particular discrepancy exists after this particular questionnaire do you think the gen- uh, this type of gender discrimination is correct everybody was in favor of saying that no it is not correct factors that are contributing to pink tricks are first marketing and advertising cost the uh, the marketing the producers are marketing their product differently for men and women to attract their target customers and that should be changed perception that women will pay more women are tend to to pay more because they we want women to behave or present themselves in a particular manner so they have to pay more for that particular uh, necessity or particular luxury discrimination against women the pink tax can also be seen as a discrimination the practice of gender pricing implies that women's product of lower quality compared to men products justifying the lower price point women then have to pay more for higher quality products this discrimination contributes to existing gender pay gap and undermines women's economic well-being next the effects on women's economic well-being the pink tax contributes to gender pay gap and affects the women's economic well-being women already earn less than men in most industries and additional cost of gendering pricing puts an additional burden on their finances the pink tax also affects low income ref- women who can afford to pay more for similar products this leads to disparity in access to goods and services between men and women 
and the last implication of gender equality the pink tax has an implication of gender equality gender pricing leads to discrimination of women customers with uh, which perpetuates the gender pay gap and the invisibility of women's contribution in the economy it also undermines the role of women play as consumers and reinforces the idea that women are caregivers and beauty related products are among the most important goods women needs to buy as a conclusion i would take this to reduce pink tax actions are being taken in order to ensure that women participate fully and equally in the economy the united government has urged nations all around the world to take actions against pink tax <laughs> Uh, the pink tax in india affects women's economic well-being perpetuates gender stereotypes and undermines gender equality it has real life consequences that translate to reduced opportunities to limited access to essential goods and services for women and unjust economic burden on female customers the indian government has responsibility to intervene and address the issue of gender pricing and end the pink tax this can be done by implementing pricing policies initiating awareness campaigns and promoting gender neutral branding and advertising thus promoting an equal fair and progressive society that values diversity and inclusion thank you so much Anything more with questions? Anyone has a question? I guess there is. I have few uh, queries and suggestions for the people. Uh, Isha, uh, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Isha, I just wanted to know what are the gaps uh, you faced, or what are the drawbacks you faced while you collected data, uh, or while you visited the elderly women? Were they willingly uh, telling you about the problems they are facing in their elderly age, or uh, did you have to struggle to get it? Ma'am. at first it was quite struggling because uh, the, it is not quite easy for the elderly women to just uh, say uh, just say the truth right away to a stranger so i had to sit for hours and hours and make sure that uh, uh, they trust me at the same time uh, i could i i would have to sit with them and talk to them about themselves in order to get the right information because it was quite biased at first and then i learned how to uh, uh, gain the trust as well as make sure that none of this information gets out uh, that was a quite challenging phase uh, because uh, gaining trust of the respondents and then using the data of the prime difficulty every researcher faces and i would uh, give a suggestion what dr datta said that spirituality should be added to your research because that is something which contributes for mental health and quality of life of life of an elderly women a lot in this presence thank you so much isha for your paper um uh, my uh, next question goes to shima seema shukla who has presented a paper on uh, how media is affecting the Legal awareness regarding the rape case. Sima, are you there? Uh, Shah, our third paper presenter, Shama, who has talked about normalization of domestic violence and how it is analyzed in uh, family. Uh, violence over a period of time over the generation so it is nowadays very much highlighted and it is there is a movie uh, itself on that polygon uh, has produced in that to uh, make it uh, understandable to the layman that how uh, we are trying to normalize domestic violence to support priority in the society uh, so the media again is playing an important role to uh, make us uh, understand to the people that it is the, it is not the normal concept or it is the thing uh, normal which should be accepted over a period of time or something 
So Shyamal has very well uh, highlighted uh, this fact and its important part for research with the theories. And lastly, uh, uh, Dr. Shipali, I would uh, thank you for uh, presenting a paper on the pink tags because actually I've heard about the term but never actually researched on it. Uh, and uh, uh, it is a well researched paper where you have highlighted that how uh, the basic menstrual hygiene things are also being taxed, and that's why the access is so low, especially in the Asian and African countries where this is uh, promoted as one of the sustainable agenda of women. Uh, so it has to be. Uh, taken as one of the prime uh, target or prime objective by every government so that the people are not aware about it, but also they know that how they can uh, The only question I have uh, from you is that is there anything done on the behalf of government or United Nations any other uh, voluntary organization to bring awareness about this pink tax and getting rid of you from this tax? Yeah. Uh, no, ma'am. Basically, right now, only after a particular uh, group, they have uh, they have done the uh, sanitary pads on sanitary pads to remove the tampon tax. The tampon tax is very famous in New York City because it gained uh, admiration from there that, yes, this kind of a tax is available and we are facing such kind of issues. But... In India, right now, still the awareness is not there that we are paying more due to the colors. If we are buying two goods for our women only, if it is colored pink, it will be charged more than a blue colored particular product. So uh, there is no such awareness or government initiatives taken right now for this particular uh, topic, which should be done by uh, more activist, uh, social activists and the government, which I feel because People are willingly, knowingly, or unknowingly are paying more for a particular good based on its color or based on its gender. Thank you so much, Shivali. And uh, I guess uh, at least this would have brought awareness uh, to our paper presenters all here. And as a, a mother to a girl child, I will certainly notice this that is it. Uh, actually happening for each and every product or not. I'll try to do a little bit homework on that. Thank you so much uh, for your paper. And I, the paper presented in this session has uh, a wide perspective and a wide arena, which will uh, uh, certainly help everyone here present here and give them other, altogether different insights for their research. I thank the organizers who are giving you this Thank you so much, Dr. Pallavi Sena Das. We are eternally grateful to you for your wonderful chairing of the session and to all the excellent paper presenters and all the perspectives you have brought in. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you also so much as well for the ones who joined from the inauguration to the plenary to the next sessions. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much for your wonderful research papers, presentations and sharing of the session. Uh, we'll get back to you shortly after the end of the day. As of now, we wait for lunch and uh, please join us for the two o'clock session. Thank you so much and uh, see you all uh, after lunch. Thank you.